Hello and welcome to Out of Mana. I'm Garrett and I am bringing back the podcast after a couple months uh, hiatus. Um, we're doing things a little bit differently now. So if you're a previous listener, welcome back. If you're new, welcome. Uh, Out of Mana is a video game podcast. Uh, we're going to be talking about games from the past, present, and upcoming. Uh, what's exciting is that the next gen is upon us, so there's a whole bunch to talk about. Um, from now on, we're not going to be doing this as a scripted podcast. It's going to be more of a discussion. And to help me with that is my good friend and co-host, Ben. Hey, guys. Uh, if you listened to the previous episodes, I did do an interview with Ben before, so you may know a little bit about him. But um, yeah, we've been friends since, what was it, uh, fourth grade? Since fourth grade. Fourth yeah. grade, and we both lived in Oregon. Yep. Um, and we both have a lot of experience playing games, so we're just hoping to share our love for games with you and our knowledge about it, and just the excitement of what's to come. Share some opinions, whether you like it or not, and just listen to us blab about it. Yeah, seriously. Uh, before, it was, I was trying to do this by myself, and it was very scripted. And uh, it just wasn't working out. So this seems like it'll be a bit more fun. It's more of what people wanted to begin with. And so... A little more candid, a little more dialogue. Yeah, exactly. I just, you know, I was trying to just do news crunches and interviews and stuff like that. But I think people just want to hear, you know, people talk. They just want to hear discussion. Yeah, they just want to hear discussion. So, um, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself, Ben. Well, I was... I'm from California. I moved up in, to Oregon. That's where I met Garrett. And mm -hmm. years and years go by, and we eventually reconnected back in California. Yeah. And in that in between time, him and I played every game that was you know popular at the time <laughs> as time went by, especially online games. Yeah. We really enjoyed World of Warcraft, RuneScape, yeah, and some weird ones mixed in between those. A but, lot of weird ones, actually. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, if if you listen to the past ones, you, you'll 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 know some of them. Yeah. And you know we, we had some good times there, and uh, now nowadays we're just kind of focusing on what makes what, what's a lot of fun to us, like shooters or RPGs. I mean, in this case, I think Garrett's been playing a lot of RPGs lately. Yeah, I've been playing RPGs, um, trying to get a little bit through my backlog, but I don't have like a specific genre. Um, just trying to play good games. Yeah, yeah, yeah just I mean, new and old. Like I, mm -hmm. I've been I've been rewinding the clock a lot, playing Me really old too. stuff. Yeah. And it's, it's fun. Like, it's stuff from before my time and stuff from when I was too young to really appreciate it. Now as an adult, when mm -hmm. I go back, and I think a lot of people experience that, they can kind of see the game for what it was meant to be because as a kid, you just enjoy anything that's put in front of you. Yeah, I definitely get that uh, get that point of view, especially yeah. recently. Yeah. Um, so uh, you want to just talk a little bit about yourself, like what you do? Uh, I'm... I, I don't do anything involving video games in my life. I'm, I'm actually, I actually work carpentry. Nice. I'm, I'm a carpenter. I do finish carpentry for a, a local company where I live. And it's, it involves a lot. I like to do hands-on work. So that involves a lot of what I enjoy doing and video games included. You know, I, I like, I like to build things. And when I was younger, I used to build things in video games. I used to do a lot of modding and that, that just, as I got older, transferred to building real things. Yeah. I guess that's kind of a interesting take. I never... You know, I, I guess I never thought about how that could have affected your actual like, yeah. real life career. Yeah, I mean, I've always just been into architecture. So when I used to mod for video games, I'd build dungeons, I'd build buildings, you know, places for the player to explore. Mm -hmm. And as an adult, I was like, oh man, I really want to do that. I really want, I want to build that in real life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it turns out architecture is a little hard to get into nowadays, but I, I found a nice segue by doing carpentry and I enjoy the hell out of it. Yeah, you've been doing really good. It's um, fun. Yeah. Cool. And how about yourself, Garrett? What, what do you do? Um, well, uh, currently I'm a barista at Starbucks. Uh, before the whole COVID thing, I was working at a printing company. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm going to focus on Starbucks right now. And I'm actually planning on going back to school. Thank, oh, yeah. Thank you, oh, Starbucks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Starbucks has a pretty cool college uh, achievement program where they help you out a lot with the tuition. Scoop up so. those last credits. I know. I got halfway through. Yeah. Um, I went to college back in 2012 to 2014. I uh, just never finished a degree. So really looking forward to doing that again. Um, and then we'll see where that goes. Uh, I'd never did anything like, I guess I did try modding, but like video games for me, it's just like, I've just enjoyed them forever. You know, I, my, I was lucky enough that my parents put me in front of a super Nintendo when I was like four years old or something like that. Yeah. yeah. 
and since then i mean that's just been it's it's history <laughs> they would say it's the rest just like, is history as, the rest as is they history. say and um, yeah i mean but, but in my case i had to kind of force video games into my family my, my mom was one of those moms who did not like video games and she she you know she was kind of attending the harry potter book burnings at the time just, yeah. <laughs> just, just, just to say the least but it's video games have just been an incredible part of both of our lives and it's I mean, as an adult, it just keeps going. Like, the stuff keeps getting cooler, and it's fun to talk about. I know. It's just seeing where it's going, just thinking about where it was when we were younger, and now it's like, you know, next gen's coming up, and everything just looks incredible. Oh, my God. When I when I first played Marvel when I was a kid, I was blown away. I thought that game was the epitome of graphics. I was like, this is amazing. Nothing could be any better. Then, then comes along Oblivion, and then I'm blown away again. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean... It just keeps on changing. It really keeps changing. And even my favorite games look awful now, but I still appreciate them for what they are. But current graphics, current gen graphics, especially on the new consoles, I know. just look killer. I know. It, you know, if you're a PC gamer and you're listening to this, you're probably like, yeah, I've had good graphics for all these years. Hey, but... hey, hey man, I'm talking from being a PC gamer. I've yeah. spent more money than like I, I have. I can afford on my PC. Mm -hmm. I love it. But consoles still got their thing. And they look great. Yeah, I mean they're literally built to play games, so yeah. you just you know that they're gonna work. Yep. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But so yeah, all right, let's get this started. Um, yeah, this is basically a reboot of Out of Mana, and Ben's gonna be my permanent co-host. Uh, we're gonna be trying to do this uh, weekly. Mm -hmm. Gonna try to record on Sundays, and then um, haven't hundred percent decided on a release day, but probably Monday or Tuesday. Yeah, probably Monday, Tuesday. Yeah, just get it out at the beginning of the week. Um. We could always, you know, if, if special events happen, like big announcements or a big game, something we just really want to talk about. There, there might be some hot takes in between. You, you, yeah, you never know. And, I was going to say. Just be, be sure you're checking what we're doing. You might find something. Yeah. So, all right. Well, let us talk about what we've been playing recently. I know we've both been playing some pretty... Yeah. It, it, it's interesting because you've been playing one of the hottest games right now. I, I have... So... I'm, I'm going to spoil what I've been playing by just saying I'm a big fan of Supergiant games. I love their games. I enjoy the hell out of their games. And when Hades came out, I didn't even, I didn't hear about it. Like I, it went over my head and then suddenly I caught wind of it and mm -hmm. I jumped into that game head first. Mm -hmm. I love it. Love it. I've been playing it pretty much constantly. Um, I, I've been really taking my time with it and I really enjoy it. Um, it is it is excellent. It it takes the I, I was a big fan of Binding of Isaac, mm -hmm. which is an obvious comparison. A lot of people have made already to that game. It is it's it's a roguelike, and but it takes it to a new level where the game has this deep storyline that a roguelike plays into, which roguelikes don't usually have these storylines that you play into. Like you kind of get from point A to point B and see how far you get before you get thrown back to the beginning again. Yeah, I was gonna say, do you want to like explain what a roguelike is? Yeah. So I mean, it, it's that would be the type of game where it, for instance, you would be dropped in the dungeon. You, you wake up, you're like, okay, you, you start moving from room to room, killing things, and you make it from boss, go to lower level, it gets harder, boss, lower level, it gets harder, and you die. Mm -hmm. You don't you don't reload to a save point. You wake up and you're back at the beginning again. You have to start over again. Yeah, so basically roguelikes are like, you get as far as you can, and then once you die, you start over, and you, start over. you lose all your progress. And, uh, you know, someone made a, a comparison to this the other day. Uh, on a podcast I listen to, and they're like, you know, like like sports are kind of like roguelikes, like <laughs> like the like sports are kind of the OG roguelikes because you basically you play until someone wins, and then when you start a new game, you start from scratch. Hey, it's they were talking about like how a lot of people don't like roguelikes because you don't save any progress. It's it's, it's like... a very particular genre that a subgenre in a way that a lot of people don't like. Like, and I think. When when Dark Souls came along and kind of swept the scene, it, that was kind of a a like inter, like a very slight roguelike in the sense where you can make it really far into a world, mm -hmm. and then you can die, just simply die, and you'll get thrown right back to the beginning, but you still keep your progress. Mm -hmm. So people kind of got a taste of the idea of like, I don't just get a reload and be right back to where I was. I have to work to get there again. Mm -hmm. And that, a roguelike is that, but then some, where you usually lose all your progress. Mm -hmm. And... Most games, you know, yeah, you, you, you start completely with a clean slate. You start at the beginning and no weapons, no armor, whatever type of game it would be. And in the sense of Hades, they take that to a different level where they kind of incorporate a little bit of progress saving, which makes the game 
very enjoyable because mm -hmm. you can die again and again and again. And most people will go like, oh, I don't even want to bother anymore. This is annoying. But in Hades, you actually keep some progress. And the story itself moves forward with your deaths. Oh, okay. It's, it's, inc it's very dynamic in the sense where when you finally reach the end of the game, quote unquote, you feel like all of the deaths you had were scripted with it. They were meant to happen. Like you were meant to die there. Oh, wow. Because every time you come back, characters in the game will react to it. They'll react dynamically where, oh, you died by that monster. You died by that boss. Oh, that's bad. And they react dynamically and it plays in so well. It feels so, it just feels good. I was going to say that that's one of the big things. And I'll just say that I'm not a fan of roguelikes. I've, I've tried them. I've tried Binding of Isaac um i i tried darkest dungeon that was one that i hopped on dude that was a good one i Whoa. i just didn't like it i was just it stresses me out and it like frustrates me knowing that i put all this time in and then i just have to do it over again so hades is literally the first roguelike where i'm i actually have interest in it and so uh um yeah and also because i love super giant as a developer oh yeah um you know i played at some of their previous games uh bastion yeah. and I just finished Transistor. Uh, which ones have you played by them? I have played Bastion. I have played Transistor. I did not do Pyre. Okay. Pyre, Pyre didn't quite take me like Bastion did, but Bastion was that 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 was a, that was another experience where I played that game and I was like, this is. Th there's other games like this, but there's this game is all its own. It's great, and the the narration is one of the more more famous things about that game. Mm -hmm. And it's it's excellent i love that game i'm a i'm a big fan of them that company and hades is a great step so what do you think that super giant did to a roguelike which makes hades so great i mean they basically picked up the roguelike genre shook it strangled it and then brought it back as something different like they they incorporated a lot of aspects of other games like for one a storyline like a lot of roguelikes are more of an experience atmospheric mm -hmm. gameplay experience than they are a story experience mm -hmm. there's usually some story involved a lot of them have you know di varying degrees of it but hades takes it to a degree where there's there's characters there's you, you have a hub in the game and a lot of roguelikes don't usually do a hub they usually just start you in the dungeon then you move on mm -hmm. and in this game you have a hub and every time you come back to it it changes there's a whole slew of characters that go in and out and there's some that stay more stagnant, but they all do different things. They have different reactions and they develop as you go on the game, which is very different. Roguelikes don't really have character development. Yeah. They just like, you basically start over and you're experiencing the same exact thing over and over again. So like you hear the same dialogue lines, you encounter the same, maybe not the same monsters, because I guess the thing that gets people with roguelites is how dynamic it yes, can be, the, typically. The key to them, I mean, there are some that are more static, but the key to a roguelike is difference every time. Yeah. Binding of Isaac had a, had a little story with it. You know, for instance, that, that's one of the more famous ones. And the story with it was, you know, along the lines of get out, find mom kind of thing. And that was kind of it. But the game was very deep in its lore, in the sense, where like it had all these kind of vague, quasi-Christian, Catholic references in the game mm -hmm. that you would encounter at different times and depending on what you did what items you collected etc and hades takes that differently like it's it, it kind of it, it keeps the dynamicism of like the gameplay itself where the enemies are always different you're gonna encounter something different but it's not really like is this gameplay am i gonna get that rare boss is mm -hmm. this gameplay am i gonna get that that weird encounter it's like how am I going to play differently this gameplay and get to the end? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm, you're going to get different bosses, but you're going to, it's not going to be radically different. It's going to be depending on what you're doing and how you're deciding to play differently to counteract it. That's uh, I'm I'm excited to check this game out. To be quite honest, I I'm just trying to get like through a backlog before I hop into it. But like hearing you talk about it is making me like want to go play it. Uh, what's the setting of? this game like who are the characters well it follows pretty it, it's it sets itself in hell which is the you know the, the underworld of, mm -hmm. of the, the greek mythology okay so, so it's greek mythology so it's it centers around all of those gods like the whole pantheon of greek gods I, I i don't i don't think it goes into the roman gods i'm pretty sure it's, it's it stays pretty pretty well greek and you you meet i mean you can pretty much pull any of them out of a hat and you'll meet them mm -hmm. like one way or another they incorporate it and they do really interesting takes, like visually, personality-wise, and 
they're, they're cool like they, they take gods that you can you know imagine as a marble statue and make it into a, like a living character that has a personality it's mm-hmm. not just from the you know 1990s hercules movie it's the gods from this game that they make their own that's cool because the thing about greek mythology is like one way or another they always seem to look exactly the same in the mm-hmm. games it's like slight take so who, who are you playing as you're playing as zagreus who is hades son okay so there's there's a lot more to that than just Hazagra's Hades son, but you play as him and he just kind of he's he's the rebellious son. He doesn't want to stay in hell anymore. Hades doesn't want him to leave. Okay. So the plot of the game, the basic plot is Hades is actively trying to stop him from leaving or ba- well, not actively. He's not really doing it. He's just kind of sitting back and going, "You're not going to get out of here, son." And oh, Zagreus yeah. kind of goes, "Yes, I will." And you you get some cool di- you get some funny dialogue the mm-hmm. more and more you come back you more and more you fail the more and more you come back Hades is just sitting back there with his feet up going yeah so every time you die you you come back to the hub in hell and he's probably just like oh, look who it is I told you a hundred times you've tried the, the hub is basically the the spot where all of this this spirits in that world go to get to get checked in like like Hades writes them down you know you have the, the, the guy who greets them. Um, and so when you die, you naturally end up there. You have to pass through again. And oh. Hades is there and he goes, and he just basically goes, yep, you failed again. <laughs> and it's, it's very, the, the, the humor is very dark and very cynical and it's funny. Mm-hmm. It's good. And the dialogue is fun. And Hades is a funny character. He's a great character. Mm-hmm. Like his, He's just he's just very interesting to talk to because he's always he's always got something witty to say to your character. Your character is extremely sassy and he's extremely sassy and it's funny. It's very funny to see Hades not just be you know like Disney sassy but like be like just dark and like I'm going to turn you into a pulp sassy. <laughs> so um one of my questions was um uh shoot. Oh yeah, okay. So the gods themselves now I mean, this might be like semi-spoiler territory. Do they act as bosses or are they just like characters that you meet along the way? Ooh. Uh, or is it like mix of both? Technically, neither. Okay. Technically. Okay. Because you don't actually... It's not, it's not really technically a spoiler. You don't, you don't meet them in person. Like, so okay. When it comes, so there's the Olympian gods and there's the underworld gods. Okay. And the Olympian gods are... You know, they're, they're basically saying, Zagreus, come to Olympus. It's awesome up here. Come on. Come up, man. Mm-hmm. And so as you're going through the dungeons, you encounter their, what the game what the game calls them, boons, which is basically the blessing that the gods will bestow upon you as, as you go. And that's where the roguelike dynamic comes into play in the game because you get different ones each time. Okay. That makes sense. And depending on which ones you get, you have a great playthrough. Depending on which ones you get, you have a kind of crappy playthrough. So it can be either way, and you you meet the whole pantheon. Like you, mm-hmm. you meet, you go all across the board. You meet Demeter, you you go to Apollo, you go to Zeus himself. Like, mm-hmm. and they're all awesome characters. They're all great characters. They, they're all voiced. Just, I mean, I they're I'm I'm pretty picky about my the way my characters look. I know the that's that's games. what surprises me is like the the praise you've given this game. Like Ben is like. One of the big reasons I wanted him to be co-host on the show is because he's so picky about everything. He's like the biggest critic of everything. I'm kind of the opposite. I just like, and I just try to enjoy things without thinking about it too much, which is like why I could probably never like have a career in like the games industry as like a critic at least. But like, I just, I like hearing his takes because after he says it, it really clicks in. Cause like, I don't focus on it too much. I might like notice it a little bit, but so it's, I mean, this is meaningless at this point because I'm I'm still a new person to anyone listening. But yeah. this game really did it for me. Like, I, I really enjoy the creativity with the characters and the way their personalities tie in with their classical historical personas. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, the, the the pantheon of the gods, they, they more or less act accordingly to what they are. And if they act differently, the game addresses that in a way. Mm-hmm. The, the, game's, the game is very detailed with its the way the gods act and if you for instance if you pick up a boon from zeus Mm -hmm. at the at the beginning of the dungeon at the beginning of of the underworld and then later on you encounter a neptune one one of his boons Mm -hmm. he'll he'll mention that he'll bring it up he'll say like 
oh, you, you have Zeus's boon. Well, here's mine. It's better. Oh, okay. Like, they, the game just... It is, just knows. It, it, knows it, it, dynamic, it, it dynamically affects everything you do, and it makes it feel important in that sense where mm-hmm. like you feel like you're you're affecting the game you feel like you're getting somewhere in the game you feel like you're changing the game and roguelikes don't do that yeah and that's what makes this game so different and so cool it makes it it makes you feel like you're actually doing something i was gonna say in roguelikes in my experience um the the main difference is just like yeah it, it has insane replayability because the item or power up uh choices are so diverse like binding of isaac i know people have put like thousands of hours into that because there's so many combinations of power-ups that you can decide to get and sometimes some of them don't even show up in your game so it like it's dynamic i mean that's what's so big about it some of them are incredibly rare yeah and there's there's a lot binding of isaac was a deep game yeah i mean uh, it's so it's still popular i mean people still love that game I, i love that game yeah um so, okay, my other question um, about this is uh, we mentioned earlier that Supergiant is just, like, really good at creating these, like, great atmospheric games. And yes. one of the big ones is, uh, well, one of them is music. They always have great music. Um, original music, too. I'm, um, And then their narration. Every game has a unique take on narration. And, like, Bastion had, like, the old westerny kind of guy <laughs> who was... He, basically, he was narrating exactly what you were doing in the game. Yep. And your character had no voice. You were just, like, playing through this game, and the narrator was taking control. Um, Transistor, um, you're this girl, and you have a sword, and, like, someone is trapped inside the sword. And so he's talking to you the whole time. Constantly. Constantly. Um, which isn't a bad thing, but like he, he it's, talks, it's, it's the personality. The he, personality is that he doesn't shut up he, sometimes. Yeah. He just never shuts up. Uh, and so again, she doesn't have a voice either. Um, so that, that's, that's where Hades takes the different route. Okay. Zagreus has a voice and he uses it a lot. Okay. He talks a lot. There is a narrator in the game. The narrator is, I, I, I would say barely present most of the time. Oh, really? Like he's present in like an important story sequences, mm-hmm. like important p- points of the game when you reach when something is going to change, like when you're doing something very dramatic, when you're finding out something very dramatic. And they, and while he has a very stoic voice, like very classic narrator voice, you know, like you know the Herodric Cube kind of thing, like mm-hmm. a little Deckard Cain in a sense, he is funny. Mm-hmm. Like he manages to incorporate some good humor, and Zagreus is aware of him. Zagreus reacts dynamically to his commentary, to his narration of the game. Zagreus, if he says, the water looks hot, Zagreus will go, oh, I suppose it does. Uh, or, you know, there, there's there's some some very particular story points in the game when the narrator is filling in the player, exposition, exposition, and he says something that is technically a spoiler to Zagreus himself. <laughs> Zagreus is unaware of this information, and Zagreus goes, wait, what (laughs) and the narrator goes okay moving on moving on like it's that scene was great that was a fantastic scene so narrator isn't aware of zagreus but zagreus can hear the narrator i think the narrator is i mean it's not there's no explicit moment where i can really point to but then i think narrators are aware he just talks over he just talks over zagreus is just a child and he talks over him Uh uh-huh so the narrator doesn't have any physical presence in the game. I'm not sure about other than that, but he's, I love the narrator in that game. Uh, but Zagreus narrates all on his own too. All the dialogue, all the conversations, Zagreus, if, if the gods talk to him, he talks back. And if, you know, if his father calls him a, you know, lowly piece of trash, he calls him one too. Mm-hmm. Like it's, Zagreus is a great character. I'm excited about that because even though I did like, you know, sometimes I do like the silent characters. So that way, like, I can't dislike them yeah because like sometimes you get a character that has a voice that's either really annoying or you just hate their personality and it kind of ruins the game for you some of the later spiral games yeah there's <laughs> like j- just there's just certain things about them um this one seems like it's really good though so i'm excited to be able to play a super giant developed game where your main character is the one that's doing a lot of the talking yeah and, and i mean when i when i first saw the character i was kind of like oh man he kind of looks he looks a little annoying like, like pretty boy edgy he's, like he just looked he looked edgy like the edge on that was so sharp you <laughs> could cut air with it like it, and that that was a first impression when i first saw him and i first heard his dialogue and then 10 minutes later i'm like i like this guy i mm-hmm. like him and i that that's unusual for me so that really excited me about that because the character was so well done that i didn't he didn't 
he looked like a trope, but he didn't fit the trope. That's good. Yeah, they typically fit the trope. I mean, they like the classic, do. like Nathan Drake from Uncharted. He's like oh. the classic, classic white guy. I guess you could say, like the Indiana he's, Jones he's, white guy. He's the, the the classic storyboard brown hair, brown eyes, white guy. Yep. Like you know, every every game's main hero. And brown I'm, hair. I'm saying that as someone, Uncharted is one of my favorite series. So it's like I I love that personality, but it's it's refreshing to see it not fit the mold sometimes it's it's refreshing to i mean you don't have a lot of characters that i mean he, he just he has a lot of good banter and, mm -hmm. and a lot of games now a lot of games especially in the past few years have focused on characters that are more reactive yeah. than, than interactive and zagros is very interactive as opposed to characters that just say what is that oh no what is that mm -hmm. oh that's happening oh that's so bad uh oh i better get away like he's actually having opinions and thoughts instead of just reacting yeah and super giant's really great about that they i remember are. in like bastion even transistor which i recently played like you know he'll be like telling you where to go and you'll like go the opposite way he's like wait wait it's not that way oh i guess you wanted to look at the water huh yeah it does look pretty doesn't it it's just like everything you do there's dialogue set to it to where it's like and i'm assuming haiti does this really well to where it's just like anything you do it feels like you were meant to do it even though you weren't technically supposed to like you can i guarantee there's so many parts of this game that you may never experience because you don't play through it enough and you're you're pretty much right like mm -hmm. the, the game i think the game is an open board where you can eventually reach every point that you might have missed before yeah because the, basically what changes a lot of the gameplay is the weapons you choose okay and you're the, the characters will also interact like react to the weapons you have like they'll say like why you're using that how dare you mm -hmm. like kind of stuff and it's i think you can basically enjoy every little aspect of the game unlike more of the linear once you've been there you can't go back there stories like super giants past games uh -huh. and in this game like it's it's i mean yeah it, it's it's not open world either it's 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 a room oriented like binding of isaac like completely like binding of isaac but once you leave the room you can't go back okay so it's you you basically go one direction or other. The narrator doesn't really dictate where you're going. He just comments on what you're doing. Okay. How like uh you got this game how long ago? Like a week ago? I'd or, say about a week ago. Yeah. About a week ago. How many hours have you put in? Jeez, uh, probably at least over two days worth. Like at oh, this point, okay. like I played a lot. I was gonna say. So I'm like, th in this. Just so you know, this game is only like twenty five dollars. I mean, uh, super giant like. It they is make, a steal. They make such good games, and, like, typically they're just, like, you know, like, Bastion and Transistor, you know, they're, like, six, eight-hour experiences. Yeah. But Hades being $25, I think it's on Nintendo Switch and PC right now. I think this is the, those are the only two places you can get it, because I was going to get it on PlayStation, and it's not there. Yeah. So, um, and their games go on sale all the time. Like, all the time. Like, on release. Hades was already on sale, like, basically after it released. It yeah, was 20 bucks. It was 20 bucks on release to celebrate, because it was in, like, beta for a couple of years or something like that. But um, and, and the comment on the 8-hour, like, 6-8-hour to eight hour thing, like, this game, again, you can spend a lot of hours. Like, you can be really good at it and maybe get through faster, mm -hmm. but the game's not over. Like, I, I've, I've completed the... I completed the length of the game, so to speak. Like, like I've gone from the end, the beginning of the dungeon, to the end of the dungeon. Mm -hmm. But the story didn't end. The story just turned a page. Okay. Basically, I got there, and and they're like, "Well, here's there's more now, and you can keep going on." Like the the story just keeps you. You basically just see that there's more to it than you thought there was originally, and as you play through, you find out new things. You 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 play through the dungeon again. And you find out new things. You, you you meet characters that you maybe didn't meet before. Mm -hmm. You find new monsters. And you get new dialogue and new insight into what's going on. And Zagreus' is past, Zagreus' is current dilemma, mm -hmm. and everyone, what they're doing around him. And it's really cool. Like, it's, re it, it, it's just hours and hours and hours more of game. Cool. All right, well, that's probably next up on my list. Is there anything else you want to mention about the game before we move on? 25 bucks is a steal this game is great great perfect all right well i guess we can talk about the latest game i play it now go for it all right so i went 
back in the time machine, back to 1995, which is kind of funny. I mentioned that. It's a fine year. It is a fine year. I was one year old when this actually, yeah, I was one year in two, not even two months old. Um, I'm talking about Chrono Trigger. Uh, this was a game released on the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, I believe, by Squaresoft. Um, this has been deemed as one of the greatest games of all time. Basically the the best a lot of people say in their yeah. books. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I've been meaning to play it for so long, but it's one of those old games where you're like, okay, first of all, where am I going to play this at? Like, am I going to emulate it? Am I going to, like, buy it? Somehow track down the original Somehow game? Somehow track down the original, which I'm not going to do. Good luck. Um, but it was released on Steam on the PC in 2018 and it was on sale. So I'm like, okay, now's the time. Um, it, it was awesome. Like, I mean, I'll just straight up say that it lives up to the hype as being possibly one of the greatest games of all time. Um, and that was a remaster. Or... So, okay. Yeah. So this Steam one, release. it's, they made a version on the Nintendo DS, um, and the Steam PC version is a port of the DS version. Okay. So I think they just added a few things in there. Um, I don't know if there's any actual like like post-game content that they added to but it. They smoothed out a lot of the gameplay. They right? smoothed it out. They made the um they made the interface a lot more friendly. Like I looked at some of the original and like, oh man, like if I had to play this in handheld or something like that, or uh just even the original, like the menus scrolling through. Oh yeah. Um, it would have been difficult. But, Tedious would be the word. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, one of the biggest reasons that it was deemed uh, so great is because it was made. It was made by like a dream team of developers. Um, I might butcher some of these names, but I got them here. Um, the the dream team was a combination of let's see here, Hironobu Sakaguchi. Uh, which is the creator of Squares at the time's uh, successful Final Fantasy of series. Course, of course. So Final Fantasy, you're already talking about one of the greatest I... franchises of all time. Yeah. Um, next is Yuji Hori, which uh, was a freelance designer and creator of Enix's uh, Dragon Quest series. So right there, you've already got two of the biggest Japanese role-playing games franchises ever. It doesn't get much more, much more dream than that, and that's just two people. That's just two people, and then... If you know anything about Dragon Quest and the art on it, uh, there's the third guy is Akira Toriyama, who is a manga artist Classic. famous for his work with Dragon Quest and Dragon Ball and yep. Dragon Ball Z. So yep. you got like two of the best JRPG creators, and then you have the art style genius of the guy behind Dragon Ball. Which doesn't get much more classic than that. That's a lot of people's childhood yeah. right there. I mean, you, you mentioned Dragon Ball, and you, you already know what these characters are going to look like. Oh, yeah. And it's just like, uh, you know, I wasn't, I didn't grow up on JRPGs, so like I didn't play any of the classic Final Fantasies, um, didn't play any of the Dragon Quest. I, I didn't even watch Dragon Ball Z growing up. Like, I, I watched a few episodes on Toonami, that was about it. Um, and like, even then it was like awkward to watch in front of my <laughs> parents because it was just yeah. like the English translation was just kind of cringy at some points. It, it was, it, it, <laughs> I just always turned it on to the point where it's like Master Roshi, Master Roshi being like a pervert. Yeah. Just like, just classic. Peachy, peachy. Yeah. He's just like, <sighs> he is, I mean, they cut a lot of that out of the English dub, but it was still, it's still like, there. The, it's still there. The, you know, they changed like the dialogue. But like him just being like a pervert old man. There, there were plenty of moments I, I recall as a kid watching Dragon Ball, just just Dragon Ball, not yes. even going on to Z, where him and other scenes were just making me go, okay, well, I sure hope my parents don't walk in right now. And that was the thing is like, and my parents always did walk in. They, they like, actually would. I'm like, okay, so that's why I never watched anime growing up was because every time <laughs> I turned it on the TV, it was something inappropriate. Yep. Anyway, or just something weird, yeah. Yeah, it's just something weird, and like just the voice acting is just like whiny girls, and I'm just like, I can't do this. You got to imagine this was the the childhood of a you know American boy who is trying not to have their parents tease them. Yeah, exactly. And so, but anime's great, and yeah, now I'm addicted to anime. So now, now I can't get enough. Of it. I don't care. So, but back when I was like 10 years old, it was a bit more embarrassing, I guess. But anyways, back to the game. Um, yeah, so it's a Japanese RPG made by a dream team. Um, now, uh, at the time, Square and Enix were two different entities. Now, you know them as Square Enix or Square Enix. I'm not quite sure how you say it. I think it's Square Enix. I think it's Square Enix. 
I think that's how it is. Um, but it, it, that might be more of like a flavor you add to it. Yeah, I've heard it both I, ways. I know plenty of people who say Square Enix. I, I do too. They, they're knowledgeable enough that I'm not going to fault them on it. Exactly. I think you can say whatever you want. Um, and e even um, apart from those guys, like this also has one of the best soundtracks ever. I mean, that's how I heard about it. Is it is one of the most legendary soundtracks in games of its time. I've been listening to the soundtrack for like two years building up to this. Like in... in it's one of those soundtracks where it's it's so good that I got nostalgia for a game that I've never played before. That's like, awesome. It, it is so the, the what what would this been? Super Nintendo is that what bit is that? Is that sixteen bit? Thirty two. I, I, I want to say eight bit. I don't think it's eight bit. I think I think sixteen. Okay. Okay. I'm really showing my lack of knowledge about so classic games. Was when you played the game was that. Did that like open up the book to go, oh my god, this is really the best soundtrack I've ever heard, as opposed to what you just heard before? Yeah, okay, so the the world is just so cool. Like the way, I mean, it. I want to say no, you know, I, I don't want to mention like too many spoilers because there's, there's, you know, this is an ancient game now. But at the same time, like, there's a lot of people who haven't played this, and I think they I haven't should. played it, and if you spoil it for me, I'll punch you. Yeah, I'm not going to spoil anything. So, you know, you, you play as, and you get to name these characters if you want. Um, but I just went with all the generic names that it gave me. It reminds me of Star Ocean. Yeah. Uh, you play as Chrono, just like this random guy in this town. And, you know, you start the game and it's, you're, there's this festival going on celebrating the, you know, it's like 1000 AD. Like it's the millennial fair. Um, and you have like your friend who's an inventor. Um, and then you meet this girl at the fair. Basically stuff happens. Uh, the big thing about the game is that there's time traveling involved. And that, that's not a spoiler. It's just like, you look at anything about Chrono Trigger, there's time travel. Um, and that's what's so cool about this game is it uses it uses the same world and map, except you're, you're visiting this world through different time periods. And so, you know, you go far back in the past and you go far into the future and all in between. And, um, you know, as you get further into the game, you know different things start happening yeah yeah so I, I can just imagine playing this in 1995 and being blown away and just being blown away by like yeah. how how cool of an idea this was so it not only looks good and like the meets the soundtrack is good um the concept is good the concept is good and uh, just everything i'm trying to like think of where to even as, begin as, with as this. someone in 2020 that sounds really awesome like i I've avoided a lot about that game because I don't want to spoil it. Yeah. So I didn't know about the time travel aspect quite. Mm -hmm. And that sounds really cool. I'm 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 sold. Yeah, it, it's just and you'll love it. I know you'll love it. Just even the just the areas. Yeah. Um so you basically meet people along the way. Uh it's one of those, you know, classic RPGs where it's uh it's like kind of turn based combat. So if you played any kind of Final Fantasy, so the classic Final Fantasy style. Yeah, you okay. build your party, you level them up, you get new items to power them up. You can choose who's in your party. Um, you can have up to three people in your party at a time. Um, and what's nice about this game is you can swap them out at any time. Oh. You don't have to like go to a hub. You don't have to like. I mean, you can't swap them out in battle, which you can do in some other RPGs, but um. It's just nice where I can do I can be in a dungeon or something like that, and I'm experiencing these enemies in this section where like someone else would do a lot better. So I can just instantly go swap them out, and they seemed they seem to like I, I don't know if I just didn't notice this, um, but they seem to be leveling up with me even though I wasn't using them. Did did you have to did you get to choose their skills like build their their skills at all? Um, or was it just equipment? It's just so there's equipment that only certain people can use. Um, there's not a lot of customization in this game, but you can you can choose whether they're going to be better at, you know, like melee combat or if they're going to be a better healer or whatever. Um, and you basically progress their skills by using them. So the more XP you get and the more monsters you defeat, you unlock more skills as you go. So the party members you're not using very often, are they kind of left behind a little bit? Yeah. So okay. they're level wise, they were only like one or two levels behind, even if I wasn't using them. So like power wise, they, you could swap them out at any time and they would be fine. Cause you could always swap equipment too. Um, but yes, there were times where like my main party, um, 
they had a bunch of skills unlocked and then I would have to switch to someone else. And I'm like, oh, I only have like their three basic skills. And it was just like, I can't do much with them. Um, okay. That, that, that sounds like about right for that time period though, yeah. in, in RPG land. So what sets this game apart, especially with its combat, because I, if you know me, I don't like turn-based combat really. I, I, like, I do know you. Yeah. It's like one of those things that gets very, very tedious and it feels very samey. Just like Divinity <laughs> didn't, yeah. didn't go for that one very much. It's just like, I don't like it. But this game did something different to where it's you can play it in two modes. There's active mode and passive mode. So in passive mode, it's classic turn-based combat where it's like your turn, enemy's turn, your turn, enemy's turn. Okay. But active, there's a bar below your character that loads, and when it gets all the way up, it's you can attack. And so you have you want to be as fast as possible to get your attack out. Because if you sit there thinking about what attack you're going to use, the enemy can hit you a second time. Like, so, so it's basically you got to be engaged it's, and ready to It's act. real time, and you okay. got to be engaged. And on top of that, you got three party members who, you know, their bars might be filling up at the same time. And so you may be in a situation where someone really needs to get healed, or someone's dead and needs revived. And so you're like, you're hustling through the menus trying to get to the item to revive them. Oh, jeez. Before the enemy gets to their turn again and kills the person who's trying to heal you. It was just like, it, typically that stuff would stress me out, but I, I wanted to challenge myself and play in the active mode because I, I'm pretty sure that's the way it's meant to be played. And it engaged you really good? It just engaged me to where I was like, I have to be on my toes and like you select which monster to hit. Um, on top of that, your special attacks, and this is probably what makes it so like amazing for its time, is like, it. You, there were certain special attacks which were like directional and depending on who you targeted, like one of Chrono's, the main character's first attacks is like a wind slash with his sword. Um, if you like attack the person in the back, like an enemy in the back, and there's an enemy in his way, it'll hit that enemy at the same time. Oh, and so, there's, so it goes through the enemy. If it'll go the through way. the enemy. And okay. there's ones that are like vertical, horizontal, and the enemies are like changing positions throughout the game. And so, and so are your characters. And so you, you can kind of be tactical with your attacks and the skills you're using. Um, there's like, and, and what was really cool is that there's like solo abilities that you can use with just yourself, or there was the, uh, the, the tech, it was called techs and there was like dual tech. Um, so dual tech is when you and another party member team up, you use two skills together to create like a combo move. Oh, and, cool. and both of your both of your characters have to be active and ready to attack but it was just so cool seeing all the combinations of things that you could use like every attack not every one of them but like most of them had like a combo move or like you know the healer might have a healing spell um and then you know there's like a an attack person like a damage person and you could combine that attack with the healer's heal and you it would just be like a like a party heal kind of thing where like you they use their attack and attach the healing to it to heal more people I, I seem to recall some similar mechanics in some of the final fantasy games to that too i'm sure and i'm not sure uh if final fantasy took that from this or this took i, it I imagine it evolved from that yeah yeah and it was just like it was so cool seeing what i could create and there was also triple techs like where all three party members team up and do like, like some like old clown each other cheerleader style and just start shouting it was yeah it was, it was it's just so cool and they're all f like so funnily animated like you know it was just, they were doing so much for such little technology yeah like, even just sprite animations like that yeah they it wasn't just like okay we're gonna raise our hands and the abilities happen it's like no there's like one where you like literally like you you get a character that's really strong and like that character like picks up your character and like literally throws them at the enemy to like go attack. <laughs> it's just so cool. And then like the the further you get, the more crazy they get. Did, did he get did he get kind of like Final Fantasy Seven and Beyond, where you had to wait ten minutes to watch the cutscene playthrough okay. before the attack actually happened? I was gonna say I was a little worried that like some of these attacks were gonna take like five minutes long, and I think like the longest one takes like ten seconds max. Okay. okay. And those are the ones where it's just like it's charging it. We're we're not there in time yet. Then okay, good. No, we. It, it, it's there they weren't so long to where you didn't want to use them okay. um so was this real-time attack mode versus the turn-based attack mode was that new to this steam version or was that original that should have been original okay yeah that, that sounds pretty like 
cool for I mean something original back then. I imagine that was a pretty dynamic thing to have. I think original. I don't know if the original had a choice. Um, I could have done the research, but I believe if anything, it was probably active because it just it. That's the way the game felt like it needed to be played. Okay. Because you, especially some bosses, you're just like you're rushing to try to get these attacks off in time before they use their attack, and it's just like you don't know the length between each attack. And so, like, you, you can't, you can't like, guesstimate. Yeah. Like, you have no idea how long it's going to take them to attack. And you could be, like, almost about to click your thing, and then it's like, suddenly they hit you, and now you're dead. And yeah. now you have to rethink your whole strategy because it's like, the person you were using to heal just died, and you don't know... Now you need to heal your other person, so you hope they don't die, so that they can use, be used to use an item to heal... It was just like so, sounds complicated. It was like, like th there's there's some moments where you get pretty tight with that. It is, and it's scary. Um, the way I I kind of avoided it was like, and I do this with all RPGs. I over leveled my characters, not not terribly to where it was like making the game a steamroll, but it was they were like two two or three levels ahead to where like I could get myself out of these situations. It's, it's a pretty classic thing to do. Yeah, you know? it's, it's it's kind of almost recommended in most RPGs it's, to do that. It is recommended. So, so the game lets you do it. So I mean, I'd say that's a good game thing to do. It is. I mean, it just makes it more enjoyable. Where, like, it was to the point where like there was never a point when I had to stop what I was doing to go grind for an hour to get leveled up to where I could attack the monsters. Because you survive. were just naturally getting ahead. Of the I was the getting ahead at, at certain points of the game. Cool. So, well, and then the fact that the game... Is smooth enough to let you do that that sounds great I yeah mean, I, I mean that sounds really nice because games you have to grind a little bit you know that's what you call a drag yeah so it sounds like the mechanics are really good like the gameplay the fighting is all really really good they so just seemed ahead so, of their time what, what, what about the story like how was the story yeah story was great um again i'm not i mean don't spoil it i'm but, not gonna but, spoil but anything give us give us some nice little so you're just you're going you're going through time uh in the same areas and so you have the same overworld map um and when you travel through time it changes but like visually it changes visually the map changes and visually the whole map itself changes cool but it's the same area and so it's like you're just either meeting you're just meeting your ancestors or you're meeting like the future you know what i mean like your ancestors like your characters spawn ancestors uh well like again no spoilers but like if you go back in time oh sorry that that's too deep of a question yeah i was just gonna say like if you go back in time you're gonna be like you might see some something that influences later in the game like if you go back in time like you see like the space odyssey scene where the monkeys are smacking each other with bones. <laughs> exactly like i mean you can go that far back it's it's just so cool and another thing i think the final thing i'll talk about is there's a lot of choices you can make in this game, which affect the story. Like, like super dynamically? Super, yeah. To, to the point where, like, I think this game has, like, 12 or 13 different endings. Oh. I got the generic main one. Okay. Because, um, honestly, I, I didn't want to use a guide, but I did use a guide for, like, this the last third of the game. A it, lot of these games you kind of need to. You, I mean, no, no, no problem with that. And what's nice is you... I didn't need this. I didn't need the guide. Um, I would have missed out on some things. The only reason I use the guide is because I only plan to play through this game once, and I wanted to experience all the possible things that I could have in one playthrough. Because um, if I didn't use a guide, there were some huge things that like I wouldn't have experienced. Yeah. And that's what's so crazy is like, I, like I, I can't talk about it because of the spoiler. But there's like a big part in the game where you're like, you you have a choice. And that choice, like, literally can change how the rest of this game goes for you. And it's just like, ah, oh, it's just so cool. Like, I just the fact, like, I could have missed that or, like, I made the wrong choice. And the whole the whole way I would have had to play the game wasn't going to be different. Yeah. Uh, it was that, just that, like, that sounds kind of reminiscent of, like, when, like I, as a kid, I played Star Ocean and mm -hmm. you did too. And, like, the big fat guide that came with it. Like, there were some points in that game when you could just easily skip on ahead and be be done with it and mm -hmm. you look in the guide and you're like whoa yeah if i go here at this point in the game this single point in the game something will happen really dramatic and, and that's the thing with the time traveling it's like you're going <laughs> in the past and you're going in the future okay so, and so, so like can you change time like any point in the game like whenever you want you can just go like snap ahead of future snap in the past okay so since this isn't like 
I mean, I, I don't know if that would be this isn't This isn't really spoilery. Um, like, is time travel, like, scripted, or is it, dy- like, can you do it whenever? It's both. Okay. Um, it's, it's scripted at first, and then, like, as the game opens up a bit more, you have freedom oh, that's cool. to get, to go back and forth. And that's where it gets dynamic, is if, if you don't go back at certain points in the game, you're going to miss this. Oh, that's so cool. So, like, if you don't go, you know, if you're in Act 7, it, there's no real acts, but I'm just saying, like, if you were setting the games in chapters... If you didn't go back in time at this certain point and meet this certain character and do this certain thing for them, then you're going to miss out an opportunity in the present day or the future setting. So I, I just think it's so cool how there's so many points of this game that you could totally blow over if you don't go back and check. And, and those little moments weren't like canned things. So if you miss them, it would affect a longer thing. Like you, you, you would miss all of that. Yeah. Uh, there's even side quests that you can miss out on. Oh. Like, big side quests if you don't do certain things. Cool, cool. So, again. It it sounds it sounds amazing, uh, but I, I, have to, I have to pinpoint the one thing that people know about this game. What about the music? Like, do you want to, do you want to give any more on that? Yeah, so the music, all the areas have great music. I just think it, it's such a wrap-up of that time period. Like, when you just think of 1995 and the music that the games had there, I feel like the com- the composer just nailed it in so many different aspects. Uh, everything just fit perfectly for the time setting. In the past, you know, it was kind of a bit more, like, mysterious and mystical. Like, in the future, it was more like... Not rocky, but it's kind of more like... It had a little bit of a modern touch to it. Yeah, it, like in the future, you know, you go pretty far in the future. And so it's a bit more like... Is it is it like a high-tech metropolis kind of thing? It's like, it's more high-tech. Okay. Um. So it, it's just like... Like modern day is like super... It's hard to explain this, you know what I, I mean? You, you don't want to spoil anything that, that, that we can just leave it there then. Yeah, I was it, just going to say the, the music is just very, very good. Well, um, what was your favorite time period for the music? Favorite time period was probably the past. The past, okay. I, I think the past was good. I mean, everyone likes that little fantasy touch, right? It, it, they, it basically takes, like, the main Chrono Trigger theme, and it makes it, like, a bit more mystical, if I okay. remember correctly. But even different, you know, the the time periods have different areas, you know? Um, and those change, too. Like, the dungeons change, depending on the time period or whatever. And, you know, each dungeon has its own theme music. Uh, yeah. Every character has their own theme song. And so there'll be parts in the story where it, it might be focusing on a party member. So when they pop up to talk, that's when it starts? So if it's an important part for them, then like maybe their theme song will start playing. Ooh, um, okay. And, and now that we mentioned that, you have different par- uh, party members. And theoretically, they can all go through this whole journey with you. And so you could... You... So you have different party members. Does that mean... You choose them, or they just reside in your party until you use them? Okay, so there's going to be set points in the game where you have to use a certain party member because they're new. Plot. Plot, yeah. Um, But then, you know, later on in the game, uh, you can pick who you want. And so there's you're going to hit story beats, and then your party members are going to have dialogue that goes along with it. And so there's certain situations where certain party members contribute more yeah because it has to do with them dude and so there's like if you don't have a certain party member at a certain time then you might miss a whole like plot point S- same or... thing with outer worlds same thing oh yeah it, it makes you so scared oh god what am i missing if i don't bring this person with me and that's why i had to resort to the guy because i'm like yeah oh my gosh like okay who's the best person to bring in here and like same thing with dungeons and stuff like that there's going to be certain bo- bosses where like you might get in there and they might be immune to the certain kind of magic user that you have and it's going to make that battle so much harder and the only way you're going to learn that is if you die by it and you have to restart back to where you saved and so like of course knowing me i i just save every five seconds like and you can only save at certain save points oh so, like, so, so you can't save scum you can't save i mean in the pc version you can like bookmark Okay. But like when you bookmark, a little bit of safe scum. You have to close the game. So when you bookmark, it closes the game. Oh. So you can't just like bookmark anytime you want. It's not like okay. save stating. Uh, the only you just have to like go to a save point, and okay. they they make them uh, frequent enough to where it's not a problem. Like there was never a time where I died, and I'm like, oh, I got to do all that over again. 
It was like maybe a few minutes. Um, damn, that's that's pretty damn good actually. I expected way worse than that. Yeah, there's been there's been games where like the save points are so far that like I want to just quit the game because I had to go so far back. Yeah, that yeah. never happened in this game. Um, part of it is because like I had the guide, so I kind of knew what to expect. But there's a save point before every boss, so. Is there a guy, save point in, in a chest with a suspiciously high amount of potions and food and yep, exactly. maybe a power up? You start finding all these chests. With and like, you think, huh, I wonder if there's a boss ahead. Yep. It's like, oh, they're giving me all these really good potions and I just got this new piece of equipment. Pretty much the classic RPG yeah. syndrome where I'm getting too much right now. Yeah. There's danger ahead. Yeah, there's obviously yeah. danger ahead. It's classic yeah. with that. Yeah. But um, it throws so many curveballs at you. Like the characters are so good and... I'll say there's there's even like surprising amount of like pro, like progressive thinking in this game for 1995. Like there's there's certain characters that I would say are like you know like uh, like sexuality wise not not stereotypical yeah, not like stereotypical like on what do you call it like a, it's not binary you know what I mean okay okay like there's a certain character that like and I if you if you know more about this game that's kind of a popular character I noticed that. I had seen this before and didn't even realize it's just a character that is just like either or. And I just thought that was really cool for a 1995. Like just that they were being that progressive at that time. Yeah. I just, I'm, I feel I'm like surprised. you don't, you don't see that kind of like, just even the dialogue was just like, I'm surprised it was even mid two thousands when we were younger. Like you didn't see that in games at all. That was no. Yeah. And I mean, and if it was, it was a joke. And in Japan too. So and I Japan, just, yeah. Go, I was just go figure. I was just really surprised. So that cool. was kind of a cool, cool thing. dude. I mean, that Chrono Trigger sounds awesome. I mean, I already thought it sounded cool. Now I know more about it. This is, I, I literally never research a game because I never wanted spoilers. Yep. So you've managed to give me the information without spoiling me, and I'm really happy. Because now it's on my list. I really want to play that. Yeah, and I, sorry, I didn't answer your question better about the music. It's just like it's just good. The music. I mean, I, I, mean, I think you did answer. It. I think. It's just good. Like, simple and plain, it's good. It's good. And it's like, a good soundtrack. Again, I don't know anything about music production, but whatever tools that they had at their to, to make this music back then, I feel like whatever tool they had, they managed to utilize it to its best ability to create sounds that I'm just, like, surprised that they got away with, you know? Hey, man, yeah. it's, not, it's The music is awesome. Like, that much I know about the game. So yeah. now that I have some back setting to it, it sounds great. Uh, and it's about, I would say, it took me about 30 hours to beat damn and i was trucking through it that's, so that, that's a healthy amount of time i'm happy you can spend more time in it i would say you i would say 28 to 33 hours okay i think my final clocking time was 33 but that might have counted some of the uh like afk time i left it sitting there okay okay so yeah but i'll wrap it up about Conan trigger uh 10 out of 10 i masterpiece you know i'm not a game critic but like you obviously enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And, and I that's the best thing you can do is say you liked it. And I don't like playing old games. Like, yeah. I simply don't. I, I find them like... Yeah, I've been trying to get you to play Marwin for a while. Yeah, yeah. It, I just find them clunky. I find them dated. Um, but when you go this far back, they're, they're so simple and classic that it doesn't affect me as much. And especially when you have a game with that notoriety in such a good way i was gonna say like there's no way this game can be bad if people are saying it's the greatest of all time yeah it's, so it's, it's no 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 bubsy like you know you're not gonna get anything bad <laughs> so yes highly recommend go play this game if you can i got it on sale for like under 10 bucks i mean like nice. it, it was just a really good that, deal. that's steam for you it's, steam's the platform that keeps on giving <sighs> okay so since i just droned on about chrono trigger for so long uh any other games you're playing right now other than hades uh, I have been playing a, a newer newer one right now, actually, and that's that's grounded. It's in early access. Oh, okay. Um, I've been playing that with with another buddy of mine, mm -hmm. and it's I've been loving it. Like, it's basically to me the, uh, just just first hand. It's Subnautica in the grass. So you you're playing in this cool jungle like world that's a backyard lawn, mm -hmm. and you meet lots of interesting creatures. Some of them are very dangerous and terrifying, especially when they drop from the literal sky upon you. <laughs> it's, I, I'm loving that game so far. It's in early access right now. Okay. But it feels pretty damn smooth for an early access game, I've got to say. I've got to say, the bugs and glitches I've encountered have been pretty minimal. And honestly, with most Bethesda games, like I've encountered way worse in a finished product. So this game is really good. Uh, do you know who developed it? Yeah, uh, Obsidian, actually, which just 
goes to show that Obsidian is consistently a great developer. Obsidian made... Obsidian made Fall of New Vegas, which oh. is one of the most famous ones. Everyone has adoring memories of that game, including me. True. And I think of you too. And they also made Outer Worlds. Oh, okay. Which, which is another game I've been playing and enjoying immensely. And I will talk about that one after Grounded. But Grounded is a great... It's it's a survival game. It's a survival game. So, oh, okay. So you have to you know eat and drink and survive against the elements, which in this case are giant insects because you your character is basically a shrunken kid mm -hmm. all the uh, 1989's honey i shrunk the kids mm -hmm. and you have to you're lost in a yard you're lost in a yard and it's it's a, it's a grass it's a tree there's a, a bush you can climb up in like it's vast like a, for what would in your mind be a small environment it is big mm -hmm. very very big you can get lost in it very easily there's a lot to find, a lot to discover. They have a lot of cool things in the ground you can find. Like the classic titular one is the one in every picture of the game, which is the baseball. Uh -huh. It's really cool. Like I, it's I, I'm, I usually like games with a little more fantasy to them, but this game catches me pretty good. For yeah, some you reason. seem to like these kind of games, like where it's just like a lot of exploration. Yeah, I, I mean, it's of course it's open world, but mm -hmm. I mean, it I, I, again back to like it's just like a Subnautica type game, where if if you haven't played that game, you really should. But it's mysterious you don't know why you're there mm -hmm. so i'm not like you know why you're there but you're kind of finding out the more deep details of that but in this game you start to do exactly the same you discover things in the game where you're it basically kind of blows your mind they're kind of like you know mind explosion moments where you're like oh that's what happened uh -huh. oh this is involved like you don't expect it and then it is like there's like technology that you don't know about and there's the presence of like entities and people that cause the technology it's not it's it's interesting it, it makes you want to find out more and the game is very there's not a lot to it right now the plot hasn't been fully expanded yet mm -hmm. but what i have played so far has been really interesting and i want to know more it seems to be getting a lot of good press too it, uh and a lot of good reviews for, for good reason really for yeah. good reason it's 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 also on the unreal engine the unreal 4 engine and it looks amazing Really? Like visually, this the game is stunning. Like the the, the water caustics, like the, I mean, just the environment. Honestly, like the, you you like the blades of grass, like beautiful. Like you look at this game, the god rays coming from the sky, the blurred horizon, which is like a house and a tree and a fence. Like uh, for some reason, those are really cool. It's it works and it looks really good. It's man, it's amazing what developers are able to do in the Unreal Engine for. Yeah. And what's just a little side note, um, I don't know if I told you this, but Unreal Engine 5 is coming out. Oh, yeah? And yeah, they released this like kind of like fake game demo for it. Uh, man, it's it looks insane. Dude, and it's, it's coming for next gen. It, it, Unreal blows blows the top off every time. They are yeah. innovators in that field, and they have an extremely accessible engine which allows games like this to be made. Grounded is a game unlike any other, mm -hmm. at least visually. Mechanically, it's very similar to Subnautica, but with very different gameplay aspects mm -hmm. and really cool. Like they, they, they just released an update recently and I played the hell out of that. Mm -hmm. It was really fun. I won't say any spoilers besides the fact that they take an, an, an area of the game that wasn't really explorable and make it explorable and it was awesome. Cool. It's a great game. And you said the other game you're playing is Outer Worlds? Outer Worlds is my other game. Another Obsidian game as, as, Obsidian. as already mentioned. Yeah. Um, I was a little late on the Outer Worlds boat, but I finally I finally got my system ready to play it, and it it just it sucked me in. Like from from the get go, like I was kind of into it. Like it, you start off with this quirky scientist talking to you, this kind of mysterious, very sci-fi setting of like you're you're stuck here and I'm gonna free you kind of thing. And mm -hmm. then it then from then I mean the game it has all these deep moments of the story and they're always wacky in some way like from the get-go from the point you land on the planet that you go to you're, you i mean th this is this is literally the first minute of the game so i'm gonna say it uh -huh. like you, you discover that that, that you, you squish the person you're supposed to meet uh -huh. like with your pot and it's it, it, when well, i mean it was it's just funny it's like oh my god like it, it actually happened like you know you, you always do that in video games so like i'm gonna get crushed by it but like no npc does that except this guy you know sherlock did that 
And dude, that that was that was funny. That was a great start. So he like he 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 rescues you, and you like get released from this pod, and then the pod lands on him and just not him. not him. The, the, oh. there's, there's, these are different characters. Oh. This is the guy who's supposed to meet you, and oh. he he meets you in a in a kind of the business end of your pod sort of way. <laughs> and it was that that was that was a great start, the great foot to step off of, almost Borderland style, I would dare say. Really, I, Outer Worlds is is kind of a. Uh, like a smorgasbord of you you got some borderlands like with that kind of humor that kind of snappy action and that the way the weapons kind of feel they kind of have a reminiscence of that and then you have like a fallout type setting like where the world kind of feels like caustic and dangerous and kind of it's it's crumbling like 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 what once was mm -hmm. is now just ruins and that's the thing is that this this game is made by obsidian who made fallout new vegas so you've got this team who's really good at making the it's an rpg right it is an rpg okay it is an rpg through and through and it has that exact feeling of a very very new vegas feeling with like a slight i, I would actually say it's it, i mean it it feels like new vegas but with like some red dead redemption thrown in there with like real wild west oh okay. new vegas went for that kind of canned wild west feel where oh this is las vegas but like the west mm -hmm. and there's a little bit of that in there but when you come to Outer Worlds, like it takes that and it and it turns it into this, the wild space west. Like you, you're going in through space and and everything has a very classical wild west feel. Like like saloons and the way the advertisements are very snake oil advertisements. Where oh take this pill and it peps you up, or take this pill and it gets rid of your ills. Mm -hmm. And you know it, everything's like advertised by some kind of company in the game, and it, it's. The, the 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 world the uh, gal uh, the universe I guess um the this the system that you're in in the game okay. is, is called Halcyon and it's it's this sort of perfect war like like perfect thing that was that was claimed by a bunch of companies a bunch of big corporations mm -hmm. that then said now we're gonna have people live here and we're gonna make our own basically our own solar system mm -hmm. and so they, they, they commandeer all these planets and they set up all these factories and etc. And it was supposed to be perfect and idyllic, kind of Irvine type thing where everything's supposed to be, you know, by the book and by letter and your tie straight. Mm -hmm. And it just fell apart. And you, can, and you can see that as you're going through the world. You can see everything that was supposed to be great is just not. And so it's just Wild West chaos. It is Wild West. It is Wild West in a kind of Bioshock setting where like everything is just crumbling and everyone's like living like the way they can mm -hmm. and they, there is no rules oh man that's <sighs> it's it, it is a great game it some people say it's a little short i i haven't beat beat it yet but i've invested a lot of hours into it mm -hmm. and for the price i paid i feel i feel satisfied i heard yeah from what i read it is short but it was like the perfect length like some rpgs can like last way too long i'm trying to think of that classic like overstay their welcome if if you if you call, I mean, I, I'm, I'm 30 plus hours in, and that's that's fair in my opinion. I mean, that's that that's because I just I like to explore, I like to loot, mm -hmm. I love games like this, and I love to go and like like stick my nose where it doesn't belong, basically. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting a lot of hours out of it. You know, some of those might be idle hours, but for the most part, I'm I'm at least like close to close to three quarters done with the game. Okay, so. I've got a lot of I've got a lot of time out of it, and I'm still gonna get more. And then there's the expansion, which just came out, which looks awesome. Oh yeah, it did just the expansion, come out. With an expansion. The expansion is, it's from what I've heard, it's supposed to be a Bioshock esque type expansion, mm -hmm. like Peril on Gorgon, I, I believe is the name of it. And it's supposed to be kind of a, what I've heard is a harken back to Bioshock One, which which has that kind of you're going into a, a place that you don't belong. And you're finding out what happened. Okay. And I'm already sold. Like, yeah. Like, and for people that don't know, Bioshock One is about going into this under this underwater city. But Bioshock is basically you inadvertently drop into an unknown world that was built to be the epitome of society and civilization, without the ills of capitalism and the ills of God and the ills of whatever communism or whatever else like it's, mm -hmm. it's supposed to be everything that the world was meant to be and it just collapsed so it, it th this whole thing really fits the setting of outer outer worlds it, it really does outer worlds kind of takes that that little nugget of 
coolness that was Bioshock and mm-hmm. was New Vegas and was all those post-apocalyptic games. And they just, it, it's you, you put it in space and it's super cool. Yeah. You, you, you're able to go to different planets. You're able to meet things that look weird and you have no idea what they are and why they are. Mm-hmm. And you can kill them and you get lots of, you can, the weapons selection is great. It's a big, you can go from sniper rifles to rocket launchers, grenade launchers, flamethrowers, and the melee weapons are really good too. I heard there's really cool, like, yeah, the melee weapons are really cool. It, I just heard that it's like really like scientific to where some of these are like really goofy, really and crazy weapons. Then then you have the science weapons, which is a category all its own. Oh, it's in the its game. own category. Okay. And the the one the one that was that kind of almost goes back to grounded is the shrink ray, which is one of the first science weapons you find, and it is really fun. It is it's not the most powerful one by far, but it is fun because you can hit guys with it. They go tiny. Their voices go squeaky, and they lose a lot of their defensive and offensive purposes, and it's funny. I was going to say, is it to the point where you can hit them with a melee weapon and they go flying? Not The ragdolls aren't quite that crazy. It's not okay. quite Skyrim level, but it is funny. And then there's there's way more science weapons than that. You find them as you play through. Mm-hmm. They're very You find them very organically in senses where you're, you're kind of not supposed to find it, and this is a secret, or this is a, like something that the, a character who had it was like wow this is an artifact but it's not it's just a science weapon mm-hmm. and it's it's fun like there's a lot of there's a lot of variety there's a lot and it's it the, you can be anything you want to be and ha- the game plays just as well like, That's you, awesome. you don't feel gimped i was gonna say one of the other things i heard about this game uh let me know if you agree is that the writing is really good it is an obsidian game and the writing is on par with obsidian's writing it is good. very very good I heard it, it's funny. It's it, when I compare it to Fallout, it's got writing that puts Fallout to shame. Like, oh, okay. Because the story, the story is kind of unknown to you, and then you slowly find it out. And it doesn't, it doesn't feel tropey. It doesn't feel contrite. It just feels. I want to know more. Like mm-hmm. I want to know more to this. Kind of, it's this, it's it's good, and the dialogue is well written. Not not all. I, some some of the voice acting is a little weak. I think in some areas, I would mm-hmm. say that the only thing in terms of dialogue I have a problem with is some of the voice acting. Okay. Not for the main characters quite, but for some of these, the, like the NPCs, they ha- have the oblivion effect where they start to sound the same. Oh, okay. And I feel like that's, I mean, it's a pretty mild complaint, but yeah, but the, the writing is, is on par and it's excellent. So since this is a, a fallout like game, uh, does it have like companion characters as well that follow that you is, around? That is one of the crowning jewels of the crown that is outer world. Okay. <laughs> And yes, the companions are very important. When you when you incorporate the companions in this game, it becomes like the show Firefly. Like I I don't know you, I don't think you've seen that show. I have Garrett, it now. But it's a very well known show. It's a Whedon show, and it is great. So in this game, your companions join you on on your ship, mm-hmm. and you basically go around and do stuff with them, and you do quests and. It's it, with Chrono Trigger. It's, it has a similar thing though, where if you if if you want to have a certain reaction or a certain branch of dialogue happen, you kind of have to have the right companion with you, mm-hmm. and you'll have no idea until it's kind of too late. Oh. So there's there's uh, I believe six companions. Mm-hmm. Uh, my 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 favorite. I mean, I think which is everyone's favorite. So I'm I'm gonna just basically follow the crowd here. Mm. Is is um is uh Parvati. She's she's the first one you meet. She's a, a darling little gem. I mean, is, is the only way to put it. Like she's like a, cute, like a Disney character, mm. but not in a way that makes you annoyed. Like she is very earnest and cool. Like I mean, you just talk to her and she's just real. Mm-hmm. And her and as you, she develops more, you kind of get this. You just get more of a look into her and what makes her her and what she's interested in and what she's good at. And she's very, she's, in my opinion, the most useful companion. Mm-hmm. She, her, like, bonuses are very good. She is, she could consistently incorporates in dialogue, which is nice. So I, I like her, I like her little additions that she adds when she talks to people. And her reactions, I mean, she, she's, a, she's basically the, the most goody character of the bunch. Mm-hmm. All, of, all the rest of them, they're, they're a very mixed bag. They're all, but they're all mostly broken in some way. 
Okay. E- even even Parvati, she she's she's kind of she has a similar thing where she's just she's not she's kind of not a whole person because she's been hurt. But the other ones are a new level. Like there's there's a uh, Ellie and there's Felix. F- Felix is uh, one of the only other male companions, and he's he's basically like the you know the world's been bad to me, so I'm kind of bad to the world kind of thing. Oh, okay. Not 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 quite as cringy as that might sound, but. He he's he's got a, he's got a level of that, and he's he's a he's a cool he's a cool character though. I, I do like him. Um, Ellie, I haven't. She didn't really take me that much, so I didn't really play much with her. Uh, so I, I can't really say much about her besides the fact that she's kind of just a. You know, street character. You know, she she's very street smart. Uh huh. And she, but she has a. Her her background kind of leads you to think like initially you meet her and you're like oh yeah you're you're you know how to get down and dirty like you. You know how, you know what the streets are like, but then you talk to her more, and you're like, "You're not quite what you seem to be. Like you, you, your past contrasts heavily with what you are now." Oh, okay. So is it, is it more like a front to like? It's it's not a front. It's just kind of she's wrapping herself in this costume of I'm not what I used to what what I was raised to be. Oh, okay. And it's she's an interesting character. I just haven't played much with her, so like I can't say much more than that, but she seems like she's got a lot of cool stuff going on. So the game has a lot of replayability because you could just like go through the game with all the different characters and just potentially hear totally different dialogues. The game, the game certainly has a lot of replayability and with the companions, that's a big part of it because mm-hmm. there's, there's more than, you know, there's Vicar Max, who is, I believe the second companion you technically meet. Mm-hmm. And he's a really cool, cool character too. He's, He's he's actually my second favorite companion. I have to say so. I mean, I'll just say it. Uh, mm-hmm. I I travel with him a lot because he's he's supposed to be a intellectual, but he just will just evolve into like emotional outbursts, <laughs> and I I find that very amusing. He is a very good character. That sounds like a fun character to and have. His, he, he could. I feel like he's a little underdeveloped as far as the rest of them are. Mm-hmm. In fact, I would I would dare say that about the male characters in general. I feel like they they just don't really have as much of an interesting background as the female characters seem to have. Mm-hmm. They're kind of just, Felix is just the, you know, oh, no one's loved me. Mm-hmm. And Vicar Max is kind of, I just, I like to find things out and I'm actually not what I seem to be. I, I, I feel like, I, I mean, they, I was a little underimpressed with their development compared to Parvati's and Nyoka's, mm-hmm. who is the last companion. And she is another very interesting one. She she has she she has more of the broken image. She wears it more on her sleeve, and she's a really good companion too. Um, but as far as the companions go, the game has a lot of replayability. You can do a lot of dialogue trees with them. Mm-hmm. If you take them out, they're gonna say something. They're gonna change something. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I've I've devolved into like three five minute plus dialogue trees because of my companions being there. Oh wow! That, a dialogue that would have ended in like thirty seconds like devolves into something that's really deep and and different yeah because they've all got their they've all got their own stories in this world yeah and so they're gonna be if you're going somewhere that involves their history or their past or whatever they're probably gonna bring it up yeah and uh so do you as a character can you i you can play however you want like you were saying you can play however you want so can you be like mr good guy and you can be mr evil i mean it's it's classic it it follows the, the the similar thing with fallout and Skyrim or uh, Elder Scrolls games too, mm-hmm. uh, where yes, you can. Your your character is ba- you make the choices based on what you want to be, and unlike Fallout Four, they actually mean something. Yeah. So you know you're not just clicking on something and it says no, but it means yes. So in this game, if you say no, you mean you mean no, and you can usually say it with a bullet to their head too if you want. <laughs> like you you can literally cut a character off, any character off. I'm talking main quest character or not Uh uh-huh but you can just blow their brains out if you want (laughs) they're not going to crumple the ground say they're unconscious their 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 head's going to go flying on on the ceiling and they're gone i mean you're going to picasso them all over the wall like it that that to me is great i i I was i it's a nice break from games where everyone is unconscious i was going to say not many games do that anymore to where like you can literally just ruin the game or not not ruin the game but like you're just not going to see that part of the game, the game anymore. Sense. Yeah. But this this game is dynamic enough that you can work around it. Like it, mm-hmm. it accounts for that possibility. So, uh, you know, I on, at the when Oblivion came out, it was every character was oh they're essential. We can't change it. They can't die. So, ever since then, it's been been like that. And this is a nice break from that unconscious. You know, this character is too important to die. You cannot kill them. Like mm-hmm. now they can all die. 
Like I, I, I love to do that. Like when I when I'm playing my game, I love to say like, hey, this character's insulting me. I'm just gonna kill him. <laughs> like like I'm not gonna let that happen. Like it, I, and you can. Yeah. And, and Obsidian worked it so, the quest or whatever they're involved with can still be completed if they're dead. That's cool. More or less. So, so some of them just get failed because you, you, they're kind of integral to finishing. You know. So you may not get a reward or something. You may like not get that. a reward, but it's it's an option, and and that to me is what makes a an RPG, an open world mm -hmm. RPG, where you can be good or bad, actually good or bad. Mm -hmm. If you're if, if you're going to be bad, you, you might as well be bad. I mean, yeah, RPG stands for role-playing game. So and if you are truly role-playing your character, and that's the decision that like you want to make... That's the decision your character will make, your character is going to make it. And it changes the world, and that's how it and is. And it's, 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 Outer Worlds is really refreshing to have a game where you can actually make those decisions and not have the game tell you no. Yeah. You can be mean, but you can't be bad. I was going to say, I think I recently, what did I play recently where it was one of those like, yeah, you can pick your dialogue choices, but like the game's still going to go about its way. The, the no game, it doesn't what. mean anything. Like, like, that was that was the problem with Fallout 4 was you can be rude to these people and they're going to be mad at you, but like they're still going to give I mean, you the at, quest. At best, like you, you had three options. Yes, <laughs> no, maybe. And maybe meant yes. No <laughs> meant meant basically go screw yourself but yes yeah so this is really nice because they, they incorporate the old style of like fallout 3 oblivion mm -hmm. dialogue where, where you have like a list that you can scroll down instead of just a little you know minimalist circle circle with, with, wheel with, with three yeah. buttons on it like you actually have content mm -hmm. the dialogue is really good the companions are really good like it's a great game so you recommend it i i recommend it uh, especially the fact that you can get it on Game Pass, like I recommend it. It's, oh, it's easy. Yes, and it's that's an easy acquisition. That is a perfect segue into the next topic. So, yeah, we spent a lot of time talking about games that we've been playing, which happen to be great games. Yeah. So, like I, you know, I played a classic that everyone loves. Ben's been playing contemporary games that everyone's loving. Um, so, with the segue into Xbox Game Pass, uh, man. The new console generation is upon us. Like, literally yeah. next month, Xbox Series X and S comes out. Gosh. And the PlayStation 5. And, yeah, it's literally a month away. The, a new frontier is opening. Literally a new frontier with hardware that, you know, I have to see it to believe it. But the, Hardware the, that's on par with a PC f for once. Yeah, like... At, at, least, at least for the most part. Like, watching the, 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 the videos where they take these consoles apart... Mm-hmm kind of blows your mind you're like th this console is actually going to perform yeah so you saw the playstation 5 yeah. breakdown video yeah. yeah there's a video where um it's from playstation so it's obviously some engineer that works at playstation yeah he, he literally takes the entire playstation apart like bolt by bolt and shows you everything that's inside and he, there were he, some he things he opens it up yeah he there's some things he pulled out where i'm like what <laughs> look at the heat sink on that thing that heat sink is so big which I'm very happy about. The the components are very impressive. I mean, I would recommend just watching it because anything we're going to say is going to undersell it, honestly. It's it's a very candid video, mm -hmm. and it really shows the potential of that console. And I'm not sure if Microsoft did that, too, with their console, um, but I wouldn't be surprised. So the difference between PlayStation and Microsoft right now as far as their, like, getting exposure of their yeah. consoles out, Xbox has been sending a bunch of Xboxes to content creators journalists to basically get a head start on writing about how great the new xbox is and like two xboxes uh you know side of things that explains all the videos i've been seeing yeah, yeah there's a lot of videos uh they obviously they can't show anything about the inter the user interface all they can talk about is damn this thing loads games fast they're still an NDA, this looks yeah. really good this is great go buy it because you know xbox lost last generation they with playstation 4 steamrolled and like i'm not saying this as a playstation fanboy like they just did the the xbox one unquestionably was not as well received as the playstation 4 yeah if, if, if you if you throw a rock at any house chances are you'll hit a playstation 4 not an xbox one yeah and it's just like for good reason too i mean they just they're the playstation 4 was more powerful than the xbox one um and it just had that, well that brings into the, the call of the exclusive titles that too which yeah. microsoft until now has had a very 
been very behind on because yeah. Gears of War, Halo, and those those are two of their flagship titles. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> those yeah. are two of their, there, there are some others, but those are two of their bigger ones, and they're just not what they used to be. They're they're, they're, they're still great games. The, the newer titles are still very good, but mm-hmm. they're not what they used to be. And then you have PlayStation, which, I mean, their exclusives are phenomenal. And then you have every other game, which is made by AAA titles, on them as well. Yeah. So where's the contest? There's none. And then Microsoft comes along this year. They, they stride out onto the runway and they say, well, guess what? We bought Bethesda. Yep. And that is the ultimate game changer for this console war. Yeah, I mean, uh, honestly, up until this point, um, you know, PlayStation is bringing in some of the best exclusive games they have I've some ever great played. Titles. They have some great looking titles. They've got they've got the rights to Spider Man, which huge right there. Yeah, uh, God of War awesome. was game of the year in 2018 yep. for good reason. It's one of the best games I've ever played. Yeah, Horizon Zero Dawn. You had you know uh, Death Stranding exclusively there yep. for like a year before it went to PC. You got Knack. Knack, of course. Knack one, two. Please, Knack three. Please, God, Knack three. Knack three better be a release title Please. for PS five, or I'm throwing mine. <laughs> What's the point? <laughs> What's the point without Knack? Uh, so yeah, I mean, um, and you know, people may still be saying this, but yeah, as you said, Microsoft, and, and this isn't just Xbox. This is Microsoft as a Microsoft as a whole, as a whole, made all one of their of, products made one of the biggest acquisitions, like money wise. This this was the time. biggest like alpha move Microsoft could have done. Like they, I mean, this was like a Disney move. Like Microsoft swept in there, bought that for a lot of money, but Microsoft can afford it, and that pretty much nets them all of the tri- majority of the AAA titles that are in people's hearts onto their side. So just to you mentioned that Disney move, uh, I, I forgot the exact amount that uh, Microsoft seven point six billion. It was something like that. Disney, oh, that is twice as much as Disney paid for the Star Wars franchise. So, like, let that sink in. that was in. astronomical at the time. That was, like, like Disney bought Star Wars? Bethesda is basically the Disney of video game, like, companies, almost. Yeah. Because so, they, look, have, they have a huge library of, of titles under, under their, their wings. Like, they, they are the publishers of a lot of titles. They, they own a lot of titles, and they're all very good. Yeah, so Bethesda's a developer... But then they were so big that they became a publisher yes. as well. So go ahead and list some of their biggest games, franchises. There is the Elder Scrolls series. There is the Fallout series. Those are the two big ones that people will always associate with Bethesda. Mm-hmm. And then you have Wolfenstein, which was revived very successfully and very, very well. And then you have Doom, of course, which, I mean, who, who hasn't played Doom? Doom is fantastic, and Bethesda now publishes them. Mm-hmm. And then you have Prey. You have The Evil Within, another great series. Mm-hmm. And then you also have the upcoming Starfield. And they also do Dishonored. Yep. And Rage, the Rage series as well, actually. Yeah, they, they did Rage as well. Mm-hmm. And they, they also have... I think you hit most of the big ones right there. I mean, like I, I, I'm honest. Honestly, I've already gone through so many. Like the, all you have to say is Bethesda equals Skyrim. Bethesda done. equals Skyrim, which is basically the the rock star of the Elder Scrolls series. Yeah, every console. It will. Honestly, I love Skyrim. I wish it would die, but yes, it's, Microsoft did a huge, big moment when they did that like like they they basically they, they showed their brass balls and they showed those hard yeah My, microsoft has changed the field with that microsoft basically showed playstation that it is it, it just it bought the library of exclusive tiles and we don't know for sure if they're going to make them exclusive but chances are microsoft's not, microsoft's not going to let that slide yeah so uh one of the i don't know i'm sure they did this on purpose but they announced that acquisition the day before pre-orders for the new Xbox came up. Yep. So it was like, hey, guess what? We bought Bethesda. Um, and that means that all future Bethesda published games are coming straight to yeah. Xbox Game Pass yep. day one yep. for free. I mean, I, well, I say for free, but Xbox... So Xbox Game Pass is a like a Netflix-like subscription to video games. It's like stupid cheap it's like 10 bucks a month and you can even get like 
three months for like a dollar kind of sale it's, thing. It's very cheap. I mean, it doesn't make everything free like like a Netflix subscription would, but mm. it's basically on par. And so any the the deal with it is anything that is made by Xbox comes to it day one. Yep. No matter how big it is, and so now the question is. Is Microsoft going to make these games exclusive to just Xbox? Or is it going to be like timed exclusive, like first 90 days on Xbox? Because the, it, 7 billion or however much it was. The chances are that, I mean, especially since they did this before the pre-order. Mm -hmm. A day before that, dude, I was like, I'm going to get a PlayStation. I'm going to get the PlayStation. I, I, why would I get a, my, an Xbox? Yeah. No one gets Xboxes. I think I even said pretty much verbatim that to you. Yeah. Like an idiot. And then the next day comes Microsoft and they say, we just bought Bethesda. And I, I swallowed those words. Yeah. I was, now I don't know what to buy. I don't know. I, I'm, and chances are actually, I actually want to buy an Xbox now, but I already have a PC, so I don't really need to. But that completely made, like, made me think about buying a PlayStation. And that's exactly what Microsoft wanted. They, yeah, I mean, Microsoft's marketing or Xbox's marketing this whole time. They've been on an uphill since the Xbox One. They I mean, do not want another Xbox One. They yeah. do not want another. They do not want to lose that again. And they they lost that so hard. And it's taken yeah. them how long to crawl back from that? I mean, what, like eight years now? I mean, it's it, they they were they were ready this time. And and even their little Twitter PR mm -hmm. being all nice and friendly and neighborly, they they know what they're doing. Yeah, they, they've got it down this time. I'm I'm really impressed with Microsoft this time around. And I actually believe that they won't, that they're going to revive the Fable series as well. Yep. Because they, they, they consumed Lionhead and killed them. And I, <laughs> I hated them for that as, as, a, as a teenager. But now I have, I actually feel hopeful that the new Fable reboot might be good. So there yeah. I go. So in, we're talking about Bethesda. One of Xbox's biggest things is, uh, it, yeah, like Ben said, it doesn't have great exclusives anymore. You've got, you basically have, they're, like big ones are Halo, Gears of War, Sea of Thieves? Oh, question Sea mark. of Thieves, of course. That's the one that's like all their marketing is so, Sea of so Thieves. So Sea of, sea of Thieves is a game you play if you want to look at really nice water effects. And then you stop playing it because there's nothing else to do. It's like a pirate co-op hangout. And I, I heard it's good, but like it's... It's, it's Pirates of the Burning Sea, but with nothing to do. You're not going to like buy an Xbox to play Sea of Thieves. Like, no. let's be honest. No. Um, it's It looks great, but I... I know it's no yeah so yeah so microsoft has bethesda which includes all you know all everyone else who was under it so like id software who does doom id software alone is a that's massive huge. jewel um and then you know they own minecraft but the difference is like they they let minecraft go on everything it's is, there, there's a, there's a there is a question there about minecraft but people are just assuming that it's gonna it's gonna keep going the way it's going and then if we go further back, um, I think it was even just the last E3, um, Xbox bought a bunch of studios. They bought Obsidian. We, they own Obsidian. You're only going to see Obsidian games on Xbox. It's a Microsoft studio now. And they created, which we haven't heard anything about, they created like a, what they call like a quadruple A game studio. Like they basically got like a super team yep. that's working on a brand new IP, presumably. We haven't heard anything about that, it. That, that that that's their like secret behind the curtain. What's behind the curtain of the quadruple IP? It's like who knows? Who knows? And it's just like Microsoft came out with big guns like this time around, as opposed to the last time, which we've already said mm -hmm. they 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 were ready and they were prepared. And if this was ten years ago, Microsoft buying Bethesda would have literally been me crying because Bethesda is now dead. Yeah, but. Current Microsoft, current times, Microsoft buying a company makes me not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm actually not worried. Besides mm -hmm. the fact that it's ex exclusive now, I'm not worried. I'm actually hopeful because Microsoft's Microsoft's been doing good. Yeah, the, the, their, their titles haven't been bad, and as, as opposed to ten years ago, and I'm I'm hopeful. I'm mm -hmm. really hopeful for the stuff they're gonna do. I'm I'm actually very interested. I so another thing is. Uh... You know, Japan is really known for its RPGs. Yes. So, and PlayStation gets a lot of exclusivity to... In including the From Software. Yeah, including From Software. Uh, so, PlayStation has had this plethora of RPGs. And Xbox, you... They don't. They don't have any... 
I mean, as far as I know, they don't have any first party studios that are making RPGs for them until now. They, when they bought Obsidian, bam, right there. Everyone was already excited. They're like, okay, they finally have an in-house RPG maker. Yes. And now they have Bethesda. That's Bethesda is like the mecca of Western RPGs. Bethesda is. It is. You got I mean, ne Elder ne Scrolls. Next to Rockstar, which is an RPG and in, in the fact that it's a storytelling game. Yeah. Bethesda is the epitome of RPGs in our Western community. So if you are a RPG fan and you love video games, like you the are, Xbox. you basically have to own an Xbox at this point. Or get a PC. Or get a PC, which is really cool of Microsoft because their whole thing isn't like yeah. you have to go buy your Xbox. They just want you in the Microsoft M ecosystem. Microsoft's PC like compatibility that they've been doing lately is awesome. I'm Stoked. Yeah, so Game Pass is on consoles, but it's also available for PC. And now the catalogs aren't identical. You actually get more on the console, I believe. But those first-party exclusives definitely will be on PC. Uh, uh, especially the Bethesda titles. Bethesda yeah. is almost guaranteed to always do PC ports. For sure. And Actually, you, I think you, they're like made for PC first. Pretty much every game is usually developed on a PC. But yeah, I mean, in this case, Bethesda translates to pc very well I mean, yeah you, you can comment on their bugs or not but very well so again xbox is in a really really good position i think they're going to do really well this generation yeah especially because they have the two versions uh so sony does as well but xbox they've got like their xbox series x which is their flagship super beastly it is actually more powerful than the ps5 okay stat wise yeah uh, if you're judging it by the uh teraflops measurement which is like they're like it's, it's a weird combo it's all mix. it's all teraflops now it teraflops it's is the, the buzzword the most in thing um it has more teraflops than the ps5 yeah um but i think this is me looking at specs and not knowing anything but i i think the ps5 is going to be faster i think the load times are going to be significantly faster on the ps5 so microsoft is not known for their smoothness on their consoles and i would dare say that's going to be the case as well again i i did read teraflops or not i did read some articles and the they compared the loading times and it is significantly different like you go get, get a new xbox the loading times are going to be so nominal that like you're going to wonder how you ever played games in the past but i, I still wonder I, I used to go up and like make myself a snack when i'd load oblivion seriously or, or something like gta oh, or, or red dead where it's one giant load time i think i think the load time on like current gen for red dead is like two and a half minutes yeah. i think on the xbox the new xbox it was like half that <laughs> it, it literally it's literally yeah. halving it um it's but amazing the the PS5, we don't know much about because PS5 or Sony isn't handing out PS5s to like every content creator so, out there. Sony's response was to do their breakdown video. Yeah. Which was very good and very candid and, and, I, and cool. It was a very cool video, but we don't hear third party. We're not getting any real stats. We're, we're not hearing people actually experience it. Yeah. We're, we're hearing Sony's PR. So... And you can see this as a kind of, in two different ways. You either see Xbox is doing this right, or you see Sony being like, look, we're, we're VIP. Like, we're, we're so confident that this is going to be good. We don't have to go hand out our consoles to make everyone say how great we are. So, Sony's also, yeah, they're, they're writing the self-satisfaction of the last generation, and they are writing that hard and high. They know they won. They they're on top i mean yeah. and they they still are and they fully expect to still be on top i mean the microsoft the bethesda acquisition was the biggest thorn in their side mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't even say a thorn i'd say that was like a tidal wave that just split them and but uh, up until that point and even after sony is still cocky and confident and self-assured and honestly i'm i'm for it because like yeah yeah me too and you you have to be because you bought one. You you bought a PS5. You're now an owner. I did. I managed to somehow secure a PS5 pre-order after two hours of refreshing the Best Buy. The whole pre-order situation for Xbox and PS5 was a disaster. That was a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Servers crashing. It, it was just it was nuts. But um, yeah. So I, I like it's kind of a weird thing where I like not knowing a lot. Yeah. Because. The thing is, is that, you know, Xbox sent on a bunch of these Xboxes 
So all these people know all these things already, and the instant the embargo's up, all these articles are going to go talking about the Xbox before you even get one in your hands. PS5, unless they change anything in the next month, we're not going to hear anything until the first day. It's, so like, it's very Right now, it's very one-sided. So everyone is, of course, especially, again, with the Bethesda, they're all leaning towards the Xbox, regardless of their affiliation. Mm -hmm. And first day, it's going to change. Yeah, like first day, you know, I could get my PS5 before some big gaming journalist, and I might experience the UI, and I didn't know anything about it. I, I just love the fact that I don't know a lot. Yeah. Like, I know enough to know that this console is going to be powerful enough, and I know that it's going to have the games that I want. Up until that point, everything else is going to be a giant surprise. It like, will. Like, I don't want to know everything about this, this shiny new toy that the I mystery, bought. The mystery is kind of nice. It kind of harkens back to, like, previous times when you get a new console, and you're like, whoa, and this I, is so cool. And I have a really good feeling that we're going to be pleasantly surprised because if Sony had any kind of hesitation that they need to be like worried that Xbox is doing this, they would do the same thing. We're like, okay, maybe we need to like get this out here too. Chances are they've got something up their sleeve. So I'm just like, and on top of that, like Xbox doesn't have like the new special dual sense controller. I, I know that's like kind of a like, it could be one of those like touch pads that you never use. It's, it's a little kitschy, maybe, but, but it could be a game changer. It could be the it could be the game changer. Like it's gonna have haptic feedback, I believe, um, and then the the triggers are gonna be what, what's the term they used? Oh, I don't remember. Um, basically, the tension on the triggers can change depending on what you're doing. So, like, if your character is a bow, like, it has does a bow, not get much cooler than that. You're literally gonna feel like. Resistance. You're having to pull, you're going to feel the resistance of the bowstring. So PlayStation's big thing, this is immersion. I've got to say that was a really cool. And on, on top of that, they're, they've got this whole new 3D audio audio thing that they're trying to go through. Um, I don't know how that works. Like I watched like the tech discussion about it. And of course, like all of it's over my head. Like I don't, but you, as long as you have a decent pair of headphones or like sound system, the the tech itself is supposed to give you like this 3d you're in there without having the software this is this is a step up from like 5.1 sound systems like, like yes this, this will supposedly be the next step in, in technology for it like it's going to be really good yeah and you know right out the gate it might not be special but this is um this is something that they're really invested in and it's only going to get better the more people use it because they're going to get more user data they're going to be able to make this just better. And so I just see I just see Sony is more innovative with what they're going for. I, I mean, if you've even seen the PS5, it looks like a freaking spaceship. Uh, I mean, it, it, it looks wild. It looks like a spaceship, but it also it, Everyone calls like it a Wi-Fi router. A Wi-Fi router. But, <laughs> but it, and it is a massive piece of equipment. It is huge. This, it, the Xbox as well is going to be big. But yeah. like the PS5 with these dramatic flanges that jut outwards and this this, this the little pearl inside of yeah. all that tech it is a very dramatic looking machine it is i dare say way more stylish than the X xbox it is stylish to either its uh benefit or its downfall or its downfall some people think it's the ugliest thing they've ever well, seen one of the, the jokes has been how to turn it on its side and yes. that there's there's going to be some bad feedback i think in the long run the the xbox is just a block Yes, it's just a black box, very blocky. It looks very modern. It looks like a it smart is, device. It is very use. sleek. It is very boring, mm -hmm. but it fits in with a lot of minimalist interiors that a lot of people have nowadays. While the PS5 has a little bit more of a look at me and the Xbox is a little more, am I here? Yeah, so just, you know, imagine you're an adult. You have your own place. You're inviting people over. Do you want them to look at the gaudy spaceship that's sitting next to your TV because it's so big that it doesn't fit in your entertainment system? Or do you want the nice black box, which people are either going to be like, oh, what's that? Or, or they just might not even notice it. They they might blend in with the environment, or it, it, they might think it's a jewelry chest to try to steal it. <laughs> or with, with the PS5, you're going to walk in and go, oh my god, the aliens have landed. Run. Yes. It's They are both very dramatically different aesthetically and both make very different appeals so yeah. it's it's going to be i'm i'm actually really excited to see what people are going to say about them in the long run 
I'm either way, I'm all for how crazy they went. Yeah. I, I love innovation. I think it's really cool. Um, you know, it's one of those things I'm not ashamed of, you know, like I'm an adult that plays video games and like, yeah, that's my spaceship. That's my video games. Machine. Video games are a part of the modern adult life. And Hey, maybe you want your, your console to be a conversation piece. Yeah. You exactly. want to put that thing on a pedestal. You want to have a light under or above it. And the PS5 is a console for that. And it literally has a pedestal that it sits on it and it lights up. So I mean, bam, there, there it's you all go. included. I mean, you, you can drop that thing with a hope diamond and it would stand out <laughs> on top. Of, I don't know if you noticed this during the breakdown video, but the white shell, they easily come off. Yep. And that guess is what that means. Customization. Guess what that means. Customization. Guess what that calls back to? That calls back to 2006 with the Xbox 360 with their face plates. Yes. Which were immediately abandoned. Immediately abandoned. But this is, this opens up the doors to not just um, like Sony first party merchandise. There's a lot of smart people with 3D printing machines yep. that can make really really customizable and i think thing. sony is aware of that for yes. the most part i think they're they're thinking there's more to the market than just the innards mm -hmm. people people love fancy looking machines yes i mean you, you you jump back to collectors and they are buying the special edition n64s the special edition ps2s the special edition xbox 360 and xboxes even now there's you know there's every time there's a new game there's a god of war edition there's a spider-man edition and people eat them up like candy because they're cool and because they're, they're they're sweet yeah and, and i think sony is kind of getting ahead of the curve i think they're going people are going to mod our, our systems they're going to change the way they look they're going to want to let's make it easy mm -hmm. and let's make money off of it i think sony is planning to have a a series of their own produced cases for the ps5 i was gonna say it's gonna be to the point where every single game put on the playstation can have an official plate potentially yeah instead of just like okay two times a year there's gonna be a 600 hundred dollar special edition yep and it's like you're gonna have a few people that break the bank on that but if you just make like a 30 dollar 40 dollar special plastic plate you're gonna sell so many more of those and you can make it for every single game it's going to be inexpensive to make. They can definitely upsell that. It's like literally plastic. And, and that was, I mean, back at the 360, that was one of the things I really liked about it as a kid. I liked that you could get face plates for it. Mm -hmm. And when they stopped that, I was, I was sad. Yeah. Because then we had a period of time up until potentially now mm -hmm. where, where consoles were just what they are. Maybe you can get a white edition. Maybe you can get a, a, a dark colored one. Maybe you can get a brown one. Maybe you mm -hmm. can get a God of War one. But that's it. Yeah. Uh, I just... These things are only a month away. I'm getting so excited. Uh, in literally a month and one day, I'm going to have one in my hands. Uh, you, you will have your own very own. Assuming Best Buy doesn't cheat me and they're like, oops, uh, don't have it. You come back in a week. Well, that's assuming our, our own postal system is even still intact enough to deliver it. Well, I, I chose like pick up from store. Oh. Like I am not. Good boy. I'm not playing that game Good with boy. Amazon. or I purposely didn't pick Amazon. Because it's just like, it's well, almost... especially this is an election year. The post office is going to be inundated. <laughs> Th that was a smart, th that was smart thinking. I was going to say that's, yeah, it's like literally a week before election. Yep. The last thing I want to do is deal with mail. So in everyone who ordered through Amazon, all that stuff is they literally within 24 hours, they got like a notice like, so this isn't, this might not arrive on day one like sorry there may be some basically delays. oops sorry we messed up or just like they expect they know that they're just not yeah. going to be able to deliver I mean, so the, the mail system is going to be wild at that time of the year i am more than happy to go drive eight miles to a best buy and yep. just go pick it up so J just don't get so we remember when the ps3 was released don't get robbed don't get killed don't get trampled <laughs> just grab it and go well, I think I'm going to be okay because like so little people were able to get a pre-order in. Cause well, that doesn't mean the people who didn't aren't going to be waiting outside for you. Okay, They're going to see your, your, your white ass just <laughs> strutting up there to grab it. That is true. That is true. I'm going to... I'm gonna be a. I'm literally gonna be a target. <laughs> he is gonna be a target. I'm like, oh, look at my fancy new box. I, I, I might, I might have to have to back you up. I was gonna say that's like that's a big parking lot too. That's the one down in Santa Cruz. That, that so is that like, is the one down. You you got you got to cross a lot of territory that you could easily be run down. I know. Oh my gosh. If 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 the PS3 releases anything to go by, and even the PS4, <laughs> you better watch out. I know. Oh man, and I did get the um the 
the more expensive one. I got the the one with the disk drive. Yep. So what, what's cool is that both Microsoft and Sony made a... I, I talked about this like 20 minutes ago and I didn't finish, but they made the flagship version um, and then they made the all digital version. Yep. And which is really cool because it makes it more accessible. It's a lot of people don't buy hard copies anymore. They so don't. It, it, it figures. And so like the, the fact that. So it, it appeals to both markets. Exactly. Um, this one was a hundred dollars more expensive just because I had a disc drive. Why I got that one. I don't know. Like, I guess because so I can play some of my I mean, PS4 games. I would get it so I could play the PS4 games and then some. Yeah. Well, and it's a Blu-ray player. Yeah. So you, you never know when you chance, want to pop a movie in there. Not that I've ever bought in the Blu-ray, purchased a Blu-ray, but like I might. And I'm going to have this thing for like the next, what, eight years maybe? And it's also a little bigger than the non-CD version. So yeah. it's cool. It is cool. And people walk in, you're like, hey, I paid a hundred extra bucks for that. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> It just, you know, I just wanted to, it's, it's one of those like FOMO things where it's like, okay, what if, like, what if something comes out just on disc and I don't have the well, option? And, and yeah. And again, the, the most important thing about it is backwards compatibility. Mm -hmm. That's a big, big feature. Yeah. People pay a lot of money for those consoles that can do that. And Xbox is hands down way, way better at backwards. Com I'm pretty sure on Xbox, you can play all the way back to original Xbox. I, I believe you're right, yeah. They, they're they doing really good about that. I can with... finally play my Blinks games. Exactly. All those Blinks games. You can play a, a Tide, the Tasmanian Tiger. Yes, and, and you know, Attack and the Power of Juju. Yes. I mean... Classics. What we're really missing, what Xbox really needs to do to take the market, just by storm, just level it out, is put Blinks back as their flagship. They should. Watch out, Mario and Sonic. <laughs> Blinks is here. Did you did you own that game? I, of course I did. Okay, I didn't. I, just... I, I bought an original Xbox when it was released. Okay. I had Blinks, and I was playing that. <laughs> uh, yeah. I even played Blinks 2. Blinks 2? I think there's a third one, too. Oh, God. So, I don't know. Oh God. You might want to look into that. I don't know if I want to look into that. I don't know if it's going to be like Sonic Battle Adventure. Like, <laughs> I don't know if they're all going to be like anime characters. It could be good or bad. But yeah, the PS5, it's only backwards compatible with PS4. And okay. like, they have confirmed that it's like, like 95, 99% of the games... And I think they recently did release the games that aren't compatible. So the good news is the list of not compatible is small. Is small. It's like they they released the list of not compatible compared to the one that is compatible. So it's not going to be a problem. Um, at least for me, I'm not, like I said, I don't like playing old games. So I I think you'll be perfectly happy with it, Garrett. I am perfectly happy with it. Uh, the problem is is um, you know PlayStation they've got their exclusives, but they aren't as accessible um and that's you know that's what makes it feel vip you know it's it, like playstation it's, does have that certain exclusivity to it where you're playing a playstation game it's only in a playstation such as bloodborne yeah which is one of the classics of like oh my god i have to have a playstation to play this mm -hmm. no one wants to miss out on that and potentially that's going to happen again mm -hmm. so that's one of the reasons why i'm looking at it and going i need a playstation yeah there's going to be games on there you want to play and they have they don't have an xbox game pass they have playstation now which is a ripoff which is it's they're trying to make it a better deal and hopefully i mean if they're smart they'll do something with it it's not going to be as good as xbox i don't think they can afford to do what xbox does I, they, the playstation has a little bit of a nintendo mindset going on where mm -hmm. our games never lose their value you will pay full price even 10 years later yes and i mean nintendo is hands down way worse about nintendo it. is way worse but playstation as far as these consoles go is on that same level where you're like come on playstation i want to play these games but you're really going to charge me full price and on top of that next gen games are more they're going to be they're, they're going to be ten dollars more they're going to be seventy dollars and that yep. just makes that xbox game pass look a lot better you're paying 10 bucks a month and getting access to a, a catalog that's constantly changing and you're getting first party games day one as part of your subscription that's so i mean set okay if one game is 70 dollars, that's seven months of game pass in that seven months you are going to get like 20 games that you're going to play 20 times 70 i mean that's the one thing that makes me feel stupid about buying a playstation is like I'm gonna be yeah. paying full price like a dummy. One one problem for these games. one problem with like is is people who want to get a hard copy. Yeah, Game Pass is great, but if you want to get a hard copy, you're gonna pay the price. But Game Pass, 
is I, I, as as someone who has been enjoying it immensely mm-hmm. lately i i cannot say enough about it it is great it is a very good value it is very good playstations now does not come even up to its heels no it's got like it's some it, good games and like every month it cycles in like a a game that's worth playing basically and then it leaves like the next month so and then it leaves the next month and then one comes in that's not good mm-hmm. as, as, as someone who's a, a picky l- little person about games playstation now did not r- work for me as well as it could have so one thing that playstation is doing um you know it's not like game pass worthy but um and this is great for having day one on a new console because you get a new console and the thing is like okay well what do i play on it there's like two games made for it I guess I'll play those two games if I even want to. I just got the new 360. I can only play Cameo. Yeah, exactly. That was the thing. You get the 360. It's like, okay, I guess I have Cameo. That's all I have. It, it, that took a while. And then like King Kong. That took a <laughs> while. Like the 360's release was like a little slow. But um, so PlayStation has a subscription thing called PlayStation Plus, which you have to purchase to play like online games. Um. So, like, most PlayStation owners have this if they do any kind of online thing. It also gives you discounts on games, and you also get a couple free games a month. So, you know, it's, like, it's not that expensive. You can pay, like, 60 bucks for a whole year. Um, if you have that, um, you're going to get a new thing called, I think it's, like, the PlayStation Collection or something like that. Day one on the PS5, you're going to have access to, like, I think it's, like, 20 or 25 of PlayStation 4's biggest hits. Whew. So right off the bat, it's included in there. You're going to be able to play uh, like God of War, Bloodborne. Spider-Man? Uh, I think Spider-Man's in it. They better. I, I, I'm I, not going to 100% say that, especially because they're trying to resell that game with Miles Morales, Miles Morales, uh, plus the remaster of the yeah. Spider-Man. As, so, as, as not quite Peter Parker. So, okay. <laughs> a- anyway, so Spider-Man may not be in that list. I, I should have brought it up, but um, it has really really good games yeah last of yeah. us it has but playstation's ev- like chronology of games is great yes there is no way they can go wrong with that so you can buy a ps5 um and say you never had a ps4 before or even maybe you did and you didn't play all of them you can get a ps5 pay the like 60 dollars a year for this thing and you almost already have a year's worth of great games to it's play just, it's, that's that's pretty solid yeah i mean that that looks good as opposed to what they have now and it's funny because it's like some of the games that are listed on there, um, like I recently purchased, like used because I was excited to play them. For a thick cut. And now it's like, oh, now they're just there. Like, uh, I kind of feel stupid for buying those now because now they're going to be free. But, but you would have had to wait a whole month. I know. Well, I, I'm i actually even holding off right now from playing my backlog on PlayStation. Because I'm like, well, it might just run better on PS5. So, if it's backwards, yeah, go for it. May as well. I mean, I, I've got other games to play on PC, so as you One, can tell, I I played Chrono Trigger and Transistor. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I'm just really excited. I I can't stop like talking about this stuff because it's it's been it's been so long. It's been like eight or nine years since it the new generation. It's been a long time. They did like a half step with the Xbox One X and then the PS5 PS4 Pro. Yeah, which was cool, but like now your ps4 pro is just a paperweight it's crazy to think that like that piece of machinery is going to be like slow like compared to this new machine it's going to be like just just bad i mean not bad but it's i mean you can give it to me i'll be happy (laughs) i was gonna say you might as well borrow it because like yeah as opposed to my like tiny ancient crumbling ps You've got the OG four. PS4 that can't even connect to the Wi-Fi right yes, now. <laughs> because it can only do 2.4. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, oh, man. I'm just... Yeah. yeah I'm excited. It, it's There's a lot to be excited about. You you got it coming to you, too. So I, I bet you're excited. I am fully I'm, prepared. I'm excited for you, like, vicariously. I'm, I'm in it. I mean, I, I'm sure I'll bring it over and we can play some games together. Oh, yeah. Because it's going to have some pretty good day one launch titles. You get... The new Spider-Man Miles Morales um, game. It's oh, gonna be so good. Demon Souls, the uh, remake of Demon Souls. Oh god, that's like um, Ambrosia. Mm. There's other great ones too. I'm like totally blanking on. Like I don't know if the new Ratchet and Clank is a new. The the list goes on, and it's gonna be really good. It's gonna be good, and that's the thing is like, Xbox. I don't think they have any like super big hitting launch titles right now. 
Like they, they're, they're so their consoles being like blown out and everyone's going, wow, it's a great, but we don't really know what we're going to get yet. We still don't know what we're going to get because everything's still in development. They bought all these studios and it's like, okay, well. They're, they're basically showing us what they got in their arsenal, but we don't know what they're going to give to us. So we'll see. And with PlayStation, you just, you know, amazing developers, you've, you already got games day one, which you're going to be able to play. And like, there's even games in a couple months that you'll be able to, um, play so yeah. i just like i i don't know i'm super excited do you when do you plan on getting one do you think you're gonna get one anytime soon i'm i'm gonna wait i'm, I'm gonna wait till i don't have to battle ten thousand bots True. to to buy one console and then have True. to buy it from ebay for five thousand dollars so I'm, I'm gonna wait <laughs> i'm gonna wait just a little bit because yeah i'm, I'm okay I'll, I'll i'll just i'll mooch off of you for a little while not to mention you just upgraded your pc yeah my, my pc's Will, ready, willing, and able to play games right now, so I'm going to give it all at once. Cool. All right, well, I guess this will be a good time to stop. Just uh, two hours. Wow. That, that, that was pretty short. I that feel like that went, that went by quick. <laughs> so they probably won't all be two hours long, but again, as I mentioned, this is going to be unscripted now. These are yep. just going to be discussions. I'm just throwing away the script. I just want to talk and have fun. So all that two hours was a lack of script. Like, you can... You guys are pretty stoked for that, I bet. Yeah, I just... I... You know... I went back and listened to some of my old ones. I'm like, was I really trying to sound like a news anchor? Like trying to get rattle off this news? And like, Garrett, it, it was endearing. Yeah, of course. You know, it's just a whole learning process and it was it a lot is. of fun, but it is. this is just more fun. And you know, who knows? We'll probably bring on guests at some yeah. point. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's, there's, there's always people to throw in here too. Yeah. Yeah. We got Eric, your housemate. Yeah. He, he's like a Nintendo fanboy. So he is a little Nintendo girl. He'll, he'll love to join us. So in. we will, um, Definitely have him on because, like, I don't play enough Nintendo. I don't think you play enough Nintendo. I mean, I've been playing a lot lately. More than but, me. But, I mean, it's... there's We already talked about so much. We'll save Nintendo for another He's time. like a bank of knowledge there. Yeah. So, and then I've got some friends that I can bring on. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Thank you, Ben, for becoming my new permanent co-host to this. I am glad to be. You're making my job a lot easier. Hey. And I think it's more fun. A lot more fun. I'm having fun. Good. Well... Thank you for listening to the reboot of Out of Mana. Uh, you can find us on social media, actually. Um, kind of made it a little while ago. It's yep, yep. it's like a clean slate, so we're going to be posting stuff on there. It's, it's, gonna, it's, gonna, it's a tree that's going to get filled. You're yes. going to enjoy what you it's see. It's literally a seed. Um, You're going to like the way it looks. Yes. I'm going to be posting updates on there. Uh, I'll probably be putting... You know, maybe screenshots of games that we've been playing. Yeah. You know, just... Yeah. And I'm going to have the PS5 in a month, so you know I'm going to be like... I'm going to be posting pictures oh, of that. He'll, he'll be like an Instagram girl on there. Yeah, right? so... Um, Get ready. Follow us on Instagram or Twitter at pod out of mana. So P-O-D out of mana, all lowercase, all together, no spaces or anything. And, Let us uh, fill your mana. Yeah, we hope you come to us to get your fill of gaming news uh, and just our takes on games we're playing. And endless discussion. Endless why not? tangents. Yeah, I... Yeah, it's going to be fun. I'm excited yep. to see what's to come. And just because new stuff's on the horizon doesn't mean we're only going to talk about new stuff. Like, we played old games. I'm going to continue playing old games. We will definitely be pouring memories of other games out and more to come. Yeah, so hope you look forward to it. Thanks for listening. Thanks.